Small Town in Germany, written and read by John le Carré. It was Saturday morning, nine o'clock. The road from Friesdorf to the embassy in Bonn was packed tight with protesting cars, the pavements lined with photographs of the movement's leader, Klaus Karfeldt, and the banners were stretched across the road like advertisements at a rally. The West has deceived us. Germans can look east without shame. End the Coca-Cola culture now. In their car, at the very centre of the long column, sat Cork and Meadows, becalmed while the clamour of horns rose all round them in unceasing concert. Why don't you get out and walk, said Meadows gloomily. I would if I was your age, quicker than sitting with this scum. I'll be all right said Cork, the albino cipher clerk, and looked anxiously at the older man in the driving seat beside him. We'll have to hurry slowly, he added in his most conciliatory tone. Cork was a cockney, bright as paint, and it worried him to see the older man Meadows all het up. We'll just have to let it happen to us, won't we, Arthur? What the hell do they want with it, then? All the screaming? Bloody good haircut, that's what half of them need. Good hiding and back to school. It's the farmers, said Cork. I told you, they're picketing the Bundestag. Farmers, this lot, they'd die if they got their feet wet, half of them. Kids, look at that crowd there, then. Disgusting, that's what I call it. This cast Meadows into even deeper gloom, and after that Cork chose silence as the wiser course. Short of a holiday, away from Carfelt and the Brussels negotiations, and away from his daughter Myra, thought Cork, Arthur Meadows was heading for the bend. Meadows, as Cork was the very first to concede, had every excuse for melancholy. He'd come with hardly a break from four years in Warsaw, which was enough to make anyone jumpy. He was on his last posting and facing retirement in the autumn, and he had a nervous wreck for a daughter. Myra Meadows was on the road to recovery, true enough, but if one half of what they said of her was to be believed... She got a long way to go yet. And add to that the responsibilities of Chancery Registrar, of handling, that is, a political archive in the hottest crisis any of them could remember. Well, even Cork, tucked away in ciphers, had felt the draft of that, with the extra traffic and the extra hours, and Janet's baby coming on, and the do-this-by-yesterday that you get from most of Chancery. And his own experience, as he well knew, was nothing beside what old Arthur had had to cope with. It was the coming from all directions, Cork decided, that threw you these days. You never knew where it would happen next. Once upon a time, Cork remembered wistfully, panics came singly. You had a scream on the Berlin Corridor, Russian helicopters teasing up the border, an up-and-downer with the four-power steering committee in Washington. Or there was intrigue suspected German diplomatic initiative in Moscow that had to be nipped in the bud, hushing up a Rhine army riot in Minden, and that was that. Until Carr felt. Cork gazed disconsolately at the posters. Until Carr felt came along. Nine months, he reflected. The vast features were plump and lifeless, the expression one of flatulent sincerity. Nine months since Arthur Meadows had come bustling through the connecting door from registry with the news of the Kiel demonstrations, the surprise nomination, the student sit-in, and the little bit of violence they had gradually learned to expect. The horns broke wildly into song again. The convoy jerked forward and stopped abruptly, clanging and screeching all different notes. Any luck with those files, then? Cork inquired his mind lighting upon the suspected cause of Meadows' anxiety. No. Trolley hasn't turned up? No, the trolley has not turned up. Listen, Arthur, you can't be blamed, not with so much going on. How can you? You know what dips are when they get to drafting telegrams. Look at Delisle. Look at Gaveston. Dreamers they are. I mean, I'm not saying they aren't geniuses. But they don't know where they are half the time. Their heads are in the clouds. You can't be blamed for that. I can be blamed. I'm responsible. All right, torture yourself. Cork snapped, his last patience gone. Anyway, it's Bradfield's responsibility, not yours. He's head of Chancery. He's responsible for security. 
With this parting comment, Cork once more fell to surveying the unprepossessing scene about him. In more ways than one, he decided, Carfelt had a lot to answer for. Parking the car in his customary place at the British Embassy building, Meadows crossed the forecourt to the front porch, where two British military policemen, a sergeant and a corporal, were examining parcels. Cork, still offended, followed at a distance, so that by the time he reached the front door, Meadows was already deep in conversation with the sentries. Who are you, then? The British military sergeant was wanting to know. On Meadows of Registry, has Mr Harting come in at all? Leo Harting, he works for me. Meadows tried to look over the sergeant's shoulder, but the sergeant drew back the list against his tunic. He's been off sick, you see, I wanted to inquire. Then why is he underground floor? He has a room there. He has two functions, two different jobs, one with me, one on the ground floor. Zero, said the sergeant, looking at the list again. And a bunch of typists, their skirts as short as the ambassadress permitted, came fluttering up the steps behind them. Meadows lingered, still unconvinced. You mean he's not come in, he asked, with the tenderness which longs for contradiction. That's what I do mean. Zero. He's not come in. He's not here. Right? They followed the girls into the lobby. Cork took his arm and drew him back into the shadow of the basement grill. What's going on, Arthur? What is your problem? It's not just the missing files, is it? What's eating you up, then? Nothing's eating me up. What's all that about Leo being ill? He hasn't had a day's illness in his life. Meadows did not reply. What's Leo been up to? Cork demanded with deep suspicion. Nothing. Then why did you ask about him? You can't have lost him as well. Blimey, they've been trying to lose Leo for 20 years. Cork felt the decent hesitation in Meadows, the proximity of revelation and the reluctant drawing back. You can't be responsible for Leo. Nobody can. You can't be everyone's father, Arthur. He's probably out flogging a few petrol coupons. The words were barely spoken before Meadows rounded on him, very angry indeed. Don't you talk like that, do you hear? Don't you dare. Leo's not like that. It's a shocking thing to say of anyone flogging petrol coupons, just because he's a... temporary. Cork's expression, as he followed Meadows at a safe distance up the open-tread staircase to the first floor, spoke for itself. If that was what age did for you, retirement at sixty didn't come a day too early. A step along the corridor from registry lay the cipher room, and a step beyond that the small bright office occupied by Peter Delisle. Chancery means no more than political section. Its young men are the elite. It is here, if anywhere, that the popular dream of the brilliant British diplomat may be realised and in no one more nearly than in Peter Delisle. He was an elegant, willowy, almost beautiful person whose youth had persisted obstinately into his early forties, and his manner was languid to the point of lethargy. This lethargy was not affected, but simply deceptive. As Meadows and Cork entered their separate estates, Delisle was gathering together the sheets of blue draft paper which lay scattered in artistic confusion on his desk and drifted contentedly onto the landing to greet the new day. At the head of Chancery's room, he knocked hard and leaned in. All present, Raleigh, ready when you are. I'm ready now. I say, you haven't pinched my electric fan by any chance, have you? It's absolutely vanished. Fortunately, I'm not a kleptomaniac. Ludwig Siegkron's asking for a meeting at four o'clock, Delisle added more quietly. At the Ministry of the Interior, he won't say why. I pressed him and he got shirty. He just said he wanted to discuss our security arrangements. Our arrangements are perfectly adequate as they stand. We discussed them with him last week. He's dining with me on Tuesday. I cannot imagine we need to do any more. The place is crawling with police as it is. I refuse to let him make a fortress out of us. The voice like the man, was austere and self-sufficient, academic, 
yet military both at once. A voice which held much in reserve, which guarded its secrets and its sovereignty, drawled out, but bitten short. Taking a step into the room, Delisle closed the door and dropped the latch. How did it go last night? Adequately. You may read the minute, if you wish. Meadows is taking it to the ambassador. I imagine that was what Siebkron was ringing about just now. I am not obliged to report to Siebkron, nor do I intend to, and I have no idea why he telephoned at this hour, nor why he should call a meeting. Your imagination is ahead of my own. All the same, I accept it for you. It seemed wise. At what time are we bidden? Four o'clock, he's sending transport. Raleigh Bradfield frowned in disapproval. He's worried about the traffic. He thinks an escort would make things easier, Delisle explained. I see. I thought for a moment he was saving us the expense. It was a joke they shared in silence. At the Chancery meeting that morning, they entered singly, Delisle at their head. Those whose habit was to greet one another did so. The rest took their places silently in the half-circle of chairs. Facing them, alone at his steel desk, Bradfield announced, Shall we begin? Jenny Pargeter was the information officer and the only woman present. She read querulously, Apart from the farmers, the main news item is today's incident in Cologne, when student demonstrators, assisted by steel workers from Krupp's, overturned the American ambassador's car. The American ambassador's empty car. There is a difference, you know. Bradfield scribbled something. Peter, you made a telegram during the night. We shall see a copy, no doubt. It sets out the principal implications. Which are? Delisle was equal to this. That the alliance between the dissident students and Carfeld's movement is progressing fast. That the vicious circle continues. Unrest creates unemployment. Unemployment creates unrest. Halbach, the student leader, spent most of yesterday closeted with Carfelt in Cologne. They cooked the thing up together. Tomorrow's rally in Hanover begins at 10.30, Bradfield continued. It seems an extraordinary time to demonstrate, but I understand they have a football match in the afternoon. They play on Sundays here. I can't imagine it will have any effect on us, but the ambassador is asking all staff to remain at home after matins unless they have business in the embassy. At Siebkron's request, there will be additional German police at the front and rear gates throughout Sunday, and plain-clothes men will also be hanging around. And plainer clothes, Delisle breathed, recalling a private joke. I have never seen. By the way, Delisle addressed them all using as his focal point that middle air, which is the special territory of the British ruling class. May I ask whether anyone is working on the personalities survey? Meadows is pestering me for it, and I swear I haven't touched it for months. Who's it marked out to? Well, me, apparently. In that case, said Bradfield shortly, presumably you drew it. I don't think I did. That's my point. I'm perfectly happy to take the rap, but I can't imagine what I would have wanted with it. Well, has anyone got it? It's marked out to me, too, whispered Mickey Crabb from his dark place by the door. Uh, you see, Raleigh, um... They waited. Before Peter, I'm supposed to have had it and put it back. According to Meadows, Raleigh. Didn't have it. A lot of dirt about German industrialists, not my form. I told Meadows, best thing is, ask Leo. Leo does personalities. They're Leo's pigeon, you see. He grinned weakly along the line of his colleagues until he came to the window where the empty chair was. Suddenly they were all peering in the same direction at the empty chair, not with alarm or revelation, but curiously, noticing an absence for the first time. Where is he? Bradfield asked. He alone had not followed Crabbe's gaze. Where's Harting? No one answered. No one looked at Bradfield. Jenny Pargeter, scarlet in the face, stared at her mannish, practical hands, which rested on her broad lap. Stuck on that dreary ferry, I should think, said Delisle, 
coming too quickly to the rescue. God knows what the farmers are doing that side of the river. Someone find out, will they? Ring his house or something, will you? It is a matter of record that no one who was present took this instruction as his own and that they left the room in curious disarray, looking neither at Bradfield nor at one another nor at Jenny Pagetta, whose confusion seemed beyond all bearing. No sooner had Delisle and Bradfield drawn up in the courtyard of the Ministry of the Interior and the doors of the car had been wrenched open by a team of young men in leather coats, all shouting at once. Herr Sipkorn will see you immediately. Now, please, yes, please, immediately, please. Thank you. I shall go at my own pace, Bradfield snapped, as they were ushered up into the unpainted steel lift. Don't you dare order me about. And to Delisle, I shall speak to Sipkorn. It's like a trainload of monkeys. What does Sipkorn want? He wondered for the hundredth time since the terse summons at nine o'clock that morning. The conference began. You will allow me, Sibkron declared, to read the following statement. Copies will be distributed. It was quite short. The doyen, he said, had already discussed with Herr Leaf of Protocol Department and with the American ambassador the question of the physical security of diplomatic premises in the event of civil unrest arising out of minority demonstrations in the Federal Republic. I'm sure you subscribe to this opinion, Sibkorn said in English, handing a copy of the statement down the table. I can see nothing here that requires to be in writing at all, Bradfield said easily. You know very well, Ludwig, that we always agree on such matters. Our interests are identical. Sipkun disregarded this pleasant appeal. You also understand that Dr. Carfeld is not well disposed towards the British, displaces the British Embassy in a special category. Bradfield's smile did not flinch. It has not escaped our notice. We rely on you to see that Herr Carfeld's sentiments are not expressed in physical terms. We have every confidence in your ability to do so. Precisely. The rest came very fast thrown down like an ultimatum. I must accordingly ask you that until further notice all British embassy staff below the rank of consular be confined to the area of Bonn. You kindly instruct them that for their own safety they will please be in their residences. He was reading again from the folder before him. Henceforth and until further notice by 11 o'clock at night. Sipkron was standing up the others with him. A terse inclination of the head replaced the obligatory handshake. The door opened and the leather coats led Delisle and Bradfield briskly to the lift. They were in the wet courtyard. The roar of the motorcycles deafened them. The Mercedes swept them into the carriageway. What on earth have we done? Delisle wondered. What on earth have we done to deserve this? Whoever has thrown the rock through teacher's window? In the English church, on a wooded hill, in a semi-rural avenue away from the centre of Bad Godesberg, the embassy staff took their customary pews that Sunday morning. Having settled into his, Bradfield searched the hymnal for the advertised numbers. Mrs. Vanderlung, the Dutch councillor's wife and currently vice president of the international ladies, leaned over her pew to inquire, in a breathy, somewhat hysterical undertone, why there was no organist. Bradfield glanced at the little lighted alcove, at the empty stool, and in the same instant he appeared to become aware of the embarrassed silence all around him, which was accentuated by the creaking of the west door as Meadows, whose turn it was to act as sidesman, closed it without benefit of a voluntary. Rising quickly, Bradfield walked down the aisle. From the front row of the choir, John Gaunt, the Chancery Guard, watched with veiled apprehension. Jenny Pargeter, upright as a bride, looked stiffly ahead of her, seeing nothing but the light of God. Janet Cork, wife of the cipher clerk, stood beside her, her mind upon her unborn child. Her husband was in the embassy, serving a routine shift in the cipher room. Where the devil's hearting? Bradfield asked Meadows. He's vanished, 
I've checked everywhere. Sick list, the doctor. I've been to his house. His car's in the garage. He's not used his milk. No one's seen or heard of him since Friday. It was a special occasion for my daughter's birthday. But he didn't come to that either. He's got engagements, but he was going to look in. He promised her a hairdryer as a present. It's not like him. Mr. Bradfield, it's not his way at all. You said a hairdryer. He's giving your daughter a hairdryer. It was a moment of deliberate inconsequence. Of deliberate slowness, perhaps. A nervous gesture before battle was joined. Meadows, at least, construed it thus. He'd ordered it, specially. Never mind, said Bradfield, and was about to turn away when Meadows addressed him once more. The file's gone. The green file for the special minutes. It's been gone since Friday. Alan Turner's shoes were of a heavy brown brogue and much repaired at the welts. He wore a stained tropical suit and carried a stained canvas bag. He was a big, lumbering man, fair-haired, plain-faced and pale, with the high shoulders and square fingers of an alpinist. And he walked with the thrusting slowness of a barge, a broad, aggressive policeman's walk, willfully without finesse. His age was hard to guess. He could alarm the young with age and the aged with his youth. His colleagues had long ceased to speculate. It was known that he was a late entrant, never a good sign, and a former fellow of St. Anthony's College, Oxford, which takes all kinds of people. The official Foreign Office publications were reserved, while they shed a merciless light on the origin of all their other turners. In the matter of Allen, they remained tight-lipped, as if, having considered all the facts, they felt that silence was the kindest policy. Mr. Lumley's looking for you, said the porter at the London office. When you can spare a minute, I'm sure. All packed for Germany, I see. His transistor radio was going all the time. Someone was reporting direct from Hanover, and there was a roar in the background like the roar of the sea. Well, you'll get a nice reception by the sound of it. They've already done the British Library. Now they're having a go at the consulate. They'd done the library by lunchtime. It was on the one o'clock. The police have cordoned off the consulate three deep. There's not a hope in hell of them getting anywhere near. It's got worse since then, the porter called after him. They're burning books in the marketplace. You wait. I will. That's just what I bloody well will do. His voice was awfully quiet, but it carried a long way. A Yorkshire voice, and common as a mongrel. He's booked your passage to Germany. You asked travel section, overland route and second class. Mr. Sean goes first. Shoving open the door of his room, Turner found Sean lounging at the desk, his elegant regimental jacket draped over the back of Turner's chair. Lumley's looking for you. I'm not going. I'm bloody well not wasting my time. Hanover's a D post. They've no codes, no ciphers, nothing. What am I supposed to do out there? Rescue the bloody crown jewels? Then why did you bring your bag? Turner picked up a sheaf of telegrams from the desk. They've known about that rally for months everyone has from Western Department down to us. Chancery reported it in March. For once we saw the telegram. Why didn't they evacuate stuff? Why didn't they send the kids home? No money, I suppose. No third-class seats available. We'll sod them. Lumley said immediately. Well, sod Lumley too, said Turner, and sat down. He read the telegrams quickly and without effort, with the confidence of an academic. The first relevant telegram was from Bradfield. It was marked Flash. It had been dispatched at 11.40 and submitted to the resident clerk at 2.28. Scarden, Consul General in Hanover, had summoned all British staff and families to the residence and was making urgent representations to the police. The second telegram consisted of a Reuter news flash, timed at 11.53, Demonstrators had broken into the British Library. Police were unequal to the situation. The fate of Fräulein Eich, the librarian, was unknown. There followed a long, if hastily compiled, summary of broadcasts and bulletins. This, too, Turner studied with close application. 
no one, it seemed, and least of all those who had been present, were able to say precisely what had triggered off the riot, nor what had attracted the crowd towards the library in the first place. Though demonstrations were now a commonplace of the German scene, a riot on this scale was not. Federal authorities had confessed themselves deeply concerned. Herr Ludwig Siebkron of the Ministry of the Interior had broken his habitual silence to remark to a press conference that there was cause for very real anxiety. An immediate decision had been taken to provide additional protection for all official and quasi-official British buildings and residences throughout the Federal Republic. The British ambassador, after some initial hesitation, had agreed to impose a voluntary curfew on his staff. Accounts of the incident by police, press and even delegates themselves were hopelessly confused. This Ike, Turner said at last, what's the latest about her? She's as well as can be expected. How well's that? That's all they said. Oh, fine. Fortunately, neither Fräulein Eich nor the library are a British responsibility. The library was founded during the occupation, but handed over to the Germans quite soon afterwards. It's now controlled and owned exclusively by the Lant authority. There's nothing British about it. So they've burnt their own books. Sean gave a startled smile. Well, yes, actually, he said. Come to think of it, they have. It's rather a useful point. I might even suggest it to press section. The telephone was ringing. Sean lifted the receiver and listened. It's Lumley, he said, putting his hand over the mouthpiece. The porter told him you're in. Turner appeared not to hear. He was studying another telegram. It was quite short, two paragraphs, not more. It was headed personal for Lumley and marked immediate and this was the second copy passed to Turner. He wants you, Alan? Sean held out the receiver. Turner read the text once and then read it again. Rising, he went to the steel cupboard and drew out a small black notebook unused, which he thrust into the recesses of his tropical suit. You stupid bugger, he said very quietly from the door. Why don't you learn to read the telegrams? We've got a bloody defector on our hands. He held up the pink sheet of paper for Sean to read. A planned departure, that's what they call it. Forty-three files missing, not one of them below confidential. One green classified maximum and limit gone since Friday. I'll say it was planned. Leaving Sean with the telephone still in his hand, Turner thudded down the corridor in the direction of his master's room. Lumley had a folder open before him, and his old hand rested on it like a claw. We know nothing about him. He's not even carded. As far as we're concerned, he doesn't exist. He hasn't even been vetted, let alone cleared. I had to scrounge his papers from personnel. And there's a smell, that's all, a foreign smell. Refugee background, emigrated in the 30s, farm school, pioneer corps, bomb disposal. He gravitated to Germany in 45. Temporary sergeant, control commission, one of the old carpetbaggers by the sound of it, professional expatriate. There was one in every mess in occupied Germany in my day. Some survived, some drifted into the consulates. Quite a few of them reverted went into the night or took up German citizenship again. No childhood, most of them, that's the trouble. What's his access? Obscure. His function is listed as claims and consular, whatever that means. He has diplomatic rank, just. A second secretary at his age. You know the kind of arrangement. Unpromotable, unpostable, unpensionable. Chancery gave him living space. Not a proper diplomat. Lucky bloke. Lumley let that go. He's locally employed, a temporary, of course. He's been temporary for 20 years. That leaves me 16 to go. In 56, he put in an application to marry a girl called Aikman, Margaret Aikman, somebody he'd met in the army. The application was never pursued, apparently. There's no record of whether he's married since. Perhaps they've stopped asking. What are the missing files about? Just a hodgepodge. Turner caught the tone and held on to it. 
What sort of hotchpotch? Policy, not your field at all. You mean I can't know? I mean you needn't know. You're to cable me every day. Bradfield is arranging facilities. But don't ring me, do you understand? That direct line is a menace. He closed the folder. I've cleared it with Western Department. Bradfield's cleared it with the Ambassador. They'll let you in on one condition. That's handsome of them. The Germans mustn't know. Not on any account. They mustn't know he's gone. They mustn't know we're looking for him. They mustn't know there's been a leak. What if he's compromised secret NATO material? That's as much their pigeon as ours. Decisions of that kind are none of your concern. Your instructions are to go gently. Don't lead with your chin. Do you understand? Turner said nothing. You're not to disturb, annoy, or offend, however hard that comes to you. They're walking on a knife edge out there. Anything could tilt the balance. Now, tomorrow, any time. Delisle picked Turner up from the airport. He had a sports car that was a little too young for him, and it rattled wildly on the wet cobble of the villages. Do you always get an escort? Turner asked him. The black opal lay thirty yards behind them. It was neither gaining nor losing ground. Two pale men sat in the front, and the headlights were on. They're protecting us, that's the theory. Perhaps you've heard of our meeting with Siebkron. They turned right, and the opal followed them. The ambassador is quite furious. Now, of course, they can say it's all vindicated by Hanover. No Englishman is safe without a bodyguard. It's not our view at all. Still, perhaps after Friday, we'll lose them again. They were approaching the embassy. As they filtered left to cross the carriageway, the black opal slid slowly past like an old nanny who had seen her children safely over the road. The lobby was in turmoil. Dispatch riders mingled with journalists and police. An iron grill, painted a protective orange, sealed off the basement staircase. Delisle led him quickly to the first floor. Someone must have telephoned from the desk because Bradfield was already standing as they entered. Rawley, this is Turner, Delisle said, as if there were not much he could do about it, and prudently closed the door on them. It was good of you to come at such an awkward time. you better let me have that. Bradfield took the canvas bag and dumped it behind the chair. Christ, it's hot, said Turner. Walking to the window, he rested his elbows on the sill and gazed out. Away to his right in the far distance, the seven hills of Königswinter, chalked over by fine cloud, rose like gothic dreams against the colourless sky. At their feet he could make out the dull glint of water and the shadows of motionless vessels. He lived out that way, didn't he? Koenig's winter. We do have a couple of rentals on the other bank. They're never much in demand. The ferry is a great inconvenience. I imagine you have a routine in such cases, don't you? You must tell us what you want and we shall do our best to provide it. Sure. The cipher clerks have a day room where you'll be undisturbed. They are instructed to send your telegrams without reference to anyone else. I've had a desk and a telephone put in there for you. I've also asked Registry to prepare a list of the missing files. If there's anything more you want, I'm sure Delisle will do his best to provide it. There's lots of routines, Turner replied at last. He was leaning against the radiator, looking round the room. In a country like this, it should be dead simple. Call in the police, check hospitals, nursing homes, prisons, Salvation Army hostels, circulate his photograph and personal description, square the local press. Then I'd look for him myself. Look for him? Where? In other people. In his background. Motive, political associations, boyfriends, girlfriends, contacts. Who else was involved? Who knew? Who half knew? Who caught a new? Who ran him? Who did he meet and where? How did he communicate safe houses, pick-up points? How long has it been going on? Who's protected him? Maybe. That's what I call looking. Then I'd write a report, point the blame, make new enemies. He continued to examine the room, 
and it seemed that nothing was innocent under his clear, inscrutable eye. That's one routine. That's for a friendly country, of course. Most of what you suggest is quite unacceptable here. Oh, sure. I've had that already from Lumley. Perhaps before we go any further, you'd better have it from me as well. Please yourself, said Turner, in a manner which might have been deliberately chosen to annoy. I imagine that in your world, secrets are an absolute standard. They matter more than anything. Those who preserve them are your allies, and those who betray them are your quarry. Here, that is simply not the case. As of now, the local political considerations far exceed those of security. Suddenly, Turner was grinning. They always do, he said. It's amazing. Here in Bonn, we have at present one contribution to make. To maintain, at all costs, the trust and goodwill of the federal government. To stiffen their resolve against mounting criticism from their own electorate. The coalition is sick. The most casual virus could kill it. Our job is to pamper the invalid, to console, encourage and occasionally threaten him and pray to God he survives long enough to see us into the common market. What a lovely picture. Turner was looking out of the window again. The only ally we've got, and him on crutches. The two sick men of Europe propping one another up. Like it or not, it happens to be the truth. We are playing a poker game here with open cards and nothing in our hand. Our credit is exhausted, our resources are nil. Yet in return for no more than a smile, our partners bid and play. That smile is all we have. The whole relationship between Her Majesty's government and the federal coalition rests upon that smile. Our situation is as delicate as that and as mysterious and as critical. Our whole future with Europe could be decided in ten days from now. He paused, apparently expecting Turner to speak. It is no coincidence that Carfeld has chosen next Friday for his rally in Bonn. By Friday, our friends in the German cabinet will be forced to decide whether to bow to French pressure or honour their promises to ourselves and their partners in the six. Carfeld detests the market and favours an opening to the east. In the short term he inclines to Paris, in the long term to Moscow. By marching on Bonn and increasing the tempo of his campaign, he is deliberately placing pressure on the coalition at the most critical moment. Do you follow me? I can manage the little words, said Turner. He had had enough. I've got the message. I'm warned off. We're on tender ground. Now what? Now this. We both know what Harting may be or may have been. God knows there are precedents. The greater his treachery here, the greater the potential embarrassment, the greater the shock to German confidence. Let us take the worst contingency. If it were possible to prove and I'm not yet saying that it is, but there are indications. If it were possible to prove that by virtue of Harting's activities in this embassy, our inmost secrets had been betrayed to the Russians over many years, secrets which, to a great extent, we share with the Germans, then that shock, trivial as it may be in the long term, could sever the last thread by which our credit here hangs. Now, wait. He was sitting very straight at his desk, with an expression of controlled distaste upon his handsome face. Hear me out. There is something here that does not exist in England. It is called the Anti-Soviet Alliance. The Germans take it very seriously, and we deride it at our peril. It is still our ticket to Brussels. For twenty years or more, we have dressed ourselves in the shining armour of the Defender. We may be bankrupt, we may beg for loans, currency and trade. We may, occasionally, reinterpret our NATO commitments. When the guns sound, we may even bury our heads under the blankets. Our leaders may be as futile as theirs. What was it Turner discerned in Bradfield's voice at that moment? Self-disgust? A ruthless sense of his own decline? He spoke like a man who had tried all remedies 
and would have no more of doctors. For a moment, the gap between them had closed. It was as if Turner heard his own voice speaking to him through the Bonn mist. For all that, in terms of popular psychology, it is the one great unspoken strength we have, that when the barbarians come from the east, the Germans may count on our support, that our Rhine army will hastily gather on the Kentish hills, and the British independent nuclear deterrent will be hustled into service. Now do you see what Harting could mean in the hands of a man like Carfelt? Turner had taken the black notebook from his inside pocket. It crackled sharply as he opened it. No, I don't. Not yet. You don't want him found, you want him lost. If you had your way, you wouldn't have sent for me. He nodded his large head in reluctant admiration. Well, I'll say this for you. No one's ever warned me off this early. Christ, I'd hardly sat down. I hardly know his full names. We've not heard of him in London. Did you know that? He's not even had any access. Not in our book. Not even one bloody military manual. He may have been abducted. He may have gone under a bus. Run off with a bird for all we know. But you, you Christ, you've really gone a bundle on him, haven't you? He's all the spies we've ever had rolled into one. So what's he pinched? What do you know that I don't? Bradfield tried to interrupt, but Turner rode him down implacably. Or maybe I shouldn't ask. I mean, I don't want to upset anyone. They were glaring at one another across centuries of suspicion. Turner, clever, predatory and vulgar, with the hard eye of the upstart. Bradfield, disadvantaged but not put down, drawn in upon himself, picking his language as if it had been made for him. Our most secret file has disappeared. It vanished on the same day that Harting left. It covers the whole spectrum of our most delicate conversations with the Germans, formal and informal, over the last six months. For reasons which do not concern you, its publication would ruin us in Brussels. Alan Turner stood facing Bradfield across the barren white room. The drumming of engines filled his ears. He thought at first it was an aeroplane, but the traffic in Bonn is as constant as the mist. Gazing out of the window, he was suddenly assailed by the feeling that from now on he would neither see nor hear with clarity, that his senses were being embraced and submerged by the cloying heat and the disembodied sounds. Listen. He indicated his canvas bag. I'm the abortionist. You don't want me, but you've got to have me. A neat job with no aftermath. That's what you're paying for. All right, I'll do my best. But before we all go over the wall, let's do a bit of counting on our fingers, shall we? The catechism began. He was unmarried. Yes. Always has been? Yes. Lived alone? So far as I know. Last seen on Friday morning at the Chancery meeting in here. What do his friends say? He has no friends worth speaking of. Any not worth speaking of? Not as far as I know. How about Germans? I've no idea. He was once on familiar terms with Harry Prashko. Prashko. We have a parliamentary opposition here, the Free Democrats. Prashko is one of its more colourful members. There is a note on file to say they were once friendly. Turner rose and ambled back to the window like a great moth lured to the light. Got a file on him, have you? His tone was very detached. He might have been infected by Bradfield's own forensic style. Only pay sheets, annual reports, a character reference from the army. It's all very standard stuff. Read it if you want. When Turner did not reply, Bradfield added, We keep very little here on staff. They change so often. Harting was the exception. He's been here twenty years. Yes, as I say, he is the exception. And never vetted. Bradfield said nothing. Twenty years in the embassy, most of them in chancery, and never vetted once. Name never even submitted. Amazing, really. Where's the rest of it? I've no idea what you mean. You've no theory, that's what I mean. It's not like anything I've ever met. 
There's no panic, no explanation. Why not? He worked for you. You knew him. Now you tell me he's a spy. He's pinched your best files. He's garbage. Is it always like that here when somebody goes? Do the gaps seal that fast? Let me help you, shall I? He's been working here for 20 years. We trusted him implicitly. We still do. How's that? Bradfield said nothing. Turner watched him with his pale hunter's eyes, watched for a movement or a gesture, head cocked, waiting for the wind, in vain. You don't even bother to explain him, not to me, not to yourself, nothing. You're just blank about him, as if you'd sentenced him to death. You don't mind my being personal, do you? Only I'm sure you've not much time. That's the next thing you're going to tell me. I was not aware that I was expected to do your job, nor you mine. So, he'd been here a long time, permanent stuff sort of thing, not fashionable, that isn't, not in an embassy. They go native if they're around too long, don't they? But then he was native, wasn't he? Did he ever talk politics at all? Never. For a long time, Turner frankly searched Bradfield's face for something he could not find. It wasn't any bloody thing then, positive or negative. Is that it? What was he then, for Christ's sake? The embassy eunuch? Haven't you any opinion at all? To help a poor bloody investigator in his lonely tusk? He was so trivial, Bradfield said at last in a moment of quite uncharacteristic softness. Can't you understand that? So utterly lightweight. It seemed to surprise him still. It's easy to lose sight of now, the sheer insignificance of him. He never will be again, Turner said carelessly. You might as well get used to that. He said he wanted to be useful. It was all so very low-key, all very delicate. He'd noticed Miles Gaveston was under strain, what with the Berlin disturbances and the Hanover students and various other pressures. Might he not help out? So you said yes. Oh, I agreed to it. On a purely provisional basis, of course. An interim arrangement. I assumed we would give him notice in December when his contract ran out, until then he could fill in his time with whatever small jobs he could find. You were sorry for him. Why won't you admit it? It's a fair enough reason, for God's sake. Yes. Yes, I suppose I was. That first time, I was actually sorry for him. He was smiling, but only at his own stupidity. Did he do the work well? Bradfield shrugged. I gave him another year which expired last December, like a license, really, a license to work, to be one of us, a license to spy. And you renewed it a second time? Yes. Why? Once more Turner was aware of that hesitation which seemed to signify concealment. We were understaffed and overworked. The inspectors had already reduced us by two against my most strenuous advice. He began by saying he didn't feel he was pulling his weight. He'd had a good year, but he felt he could do more. These were bad days. He would like to feel he was really helping to get things on an even keel. I asked him what he had in mind. I thought he just about swept the board by then. He said, well, it was December. That was the nearest he ever came to referring to his contract. And he had naturally been wondering about the personalities survey. The what? Biographies of prominent figures in German life, our own confidential who's who. Much of the material is highly unflattering, some of it is derived from secret sources. And Chancery edits this survey. Yes, once again he had chosen very accurately. It was another of those chores which interfered with our proper duties. It was already overdue. Delisle, who should have compiled it, was in Berlin. It was becoming a confounded nuisance. So you gave him the job. On a provisional basis, yes. Until the next December, for instance. For instance. And the question of vetting never crossed your mind? No, never. 
Well, we all have our moments. And that's how he got his access, I suppose. There's more to it than that. More? That's just about the lot, isn't it? We not only have archives here, we have a destruction program as well. It's been running for years. The purpose is to keep registry space available for new files and to get rid of old ones we no longer need. It sounds a somewhat academic project, and in many ways it is. Nevertheless, it happens to be vital. So Harting proposed himself for that task, too. Precisely. Where did he actually do this work? In his room? In Chancery Registry, where the most sensitive documents are kept. He had the run of the strong room. He could draw whatever he wanted, provided he didn't overplay his hand. There isn't even any record of what he did look at. There are also some letters missing. The registrar will give you the details. Slowly, Turner stood up, brushing his hands together, as if they had sand on them. Of the 40-odd missing files, 18 are drawn from the personalities survey and contain the most sensitive material on high-ranking German politicians. A careful reading would point clearly to our most delicate sources. The rest are top secret and cover Anglo-German agreements on a variety of subjects. Secret treaties, secret codicils to published agreements. If he wished to embarrass us, he could hardly have chosen better. Some of the files go right back to 48 or 9. And the one special file is what we call a green. It is subject to special procedures. How many greens are there in this embassy? This is the only one. It was in its place in registry strong room on Thursday morning. The registrar noticed its absence on Thursday evening and assumed it was in operation. By Saturday morning, he was deeply concerned. On Sunday, he reported the loss to me. I'll begin with his room. The Chancery Guard has the keys. They're expecting you. Ask for McMullen. I want to see his house, his friends, his neighbours. If necessary, I'll talk to his foreign contacts. I'll break whatever eggs I've got to, no more, no less. If you don't like it, tell the ambassador. Who's the registrar? Meadows. Arthur Meadows. I believe so. Something held Turner back. A reluctance, a hint of uncertainty, almost of dependence. A middle tone, quite out of character with anything that had gone before. Meadows was in Warsaw, wasn't he? That's correct. And Meadows has a, a list of the missing files, has he? And letters? A and Harting worked for Meadows, of course. Of course. He's expecting you to call on him. The door was opened from the outside by Delisle. His gentle features were drawn and solemn. Ludwig Siebkron rang. The exchange had orders not to push through your calls. I spoke to him myself. Well, about the librarian, Eich, the wretched woman they beat up in Hanover. About her? I'm afraid she died an hour ago. Bradfield considered this intelligence in silence. Find out where the funeral is. The ambassador must make a gesture. A telegram to the dependents rather than flowers, nothing too conspicuous, just his deepest sympathy. He was poised and perfectly in control. If you require anything, he added to Turner, you'll tell Delisle, will you? Are you McMullen? Turner asked the embassy guard. McMullen's off duty, sir. He's gone down to Nappy. Who are you? Gaunt, sir. I'm standing in for him. My name's Turner. I'm checking physical security here. I want to see room 21. Gaunt was a small man, a devout Welshman with a long memory of the depression inherited from his father. He had come to Bonn from Cardiff, where he had driven motor cars for the police. He carried the keys in his right hand, low down by his side, and his gait was square and rather solemn, so that as he preceded Turner into the dark mouth of the corridor, he resembled a miner making for the pithead. Gaunt unlocked the door to room 21 and let Turner in. Stay there, will you? If anyone comes, tell them to get out. Turner moved very lightly for all his bulk, examining but never touching. Well, I am surprised, Gaunt was saying. 
There's a lot gone, I must say. Turner did not look at him. Such as what? I don't know. Gadgets, all sorts. This is Mr. Harting's room, he explained. Very gadget-minded Mr. Harting is. What sort of gadgets? Well, he had a tea machine, you know, the kind that wakes you up. Made a lovely cup of tea, that did. Pity that's gone, really. What else? A fire. The new fun type with the two bars over. And a lamp. A smashing one, Japanese. Go all directions, that lamp would. Turn it halfway and it burns soft. Very cheap to run, as well, he told me. But I wouldn't have one, you know. Not know they've cut the allowances. Still, he continued consolingly. I expect he's taken them home, don't you? If that's where he's gone. Yes. Yes, I expect he has. What's he done, then? What's gone wrong? Done? Nothing. He's on compassionate leave. I want to be alone, that's all. Part defiant, part curious, Gaunt stayed by the door, watching as Turner pulled open the door of a wooden wardrobe and peered inside. Three hair dryers, still in their boxes, lay on the floor beside a pair of rubber overshoes. You're a friend of his, aren't you? Not really, only from choir, see. Ah. You sang for him. I used to sing in choir myself. Oh, really? Now, where was that, then? Yorkshire, Turner said, with awful friendliness, while his pale gaze continued to fix upon Gaunt's plain face. Ah, here is a lovely organist. Not at all bad, I will say, Gaunt agreed rashly recognising a common interest. Who is his special friend? Someone else in the choir, was it? A lady, perhaps, Turner inquired, still not far from piety. He's not close to anyone, is Leo? Then who does he buy these for? The hair dryers were of varying quality and complexity. The prices on the box ran from 80 to 200 marks. Who are they for? He repeated. All of us. Dips, non-dips, it didn't signify. He runs a service, he works the diplomatic discounts. Always do you a favour, Leo will. Don't matter what you fancy, radios, dishwashers, cars, he'll get you a bit off like, you know. Knows his way around, does he? That's right. Just a little friend of all the world, eh? Likes to be liked, is that it? Always willing, Gaunt continued very slow to follow the changes in Turner's mood. You ask Arthur Meadows, now there's an example. The moment Leo's in registry, not hardly a day after, he's down there collecting the mail. Don't you bother, he says to Arthur. Save your legs, you're not so young as what you were, and you've plenty to worry about already. Let me fetch it for you, look. What mail? Everything. Classified or unclassified, it didn't make no difference to Leo. He'd be down there signing for it, taking it up to Arthur. Very still, Turner said. Yes, I see that. And maybe he'd drop in here on the way, would he? Check on his own room, brew up a cup of tea, hmm? That's it? Always ready to oblige? He opened the door. Well, I'll be leaving you to it. You stay here. You'll be all right. You stay and talk to me, Gaunt. I like company. Returning the hairdryers to their boxes, he pulled out a linen jacket still on its hanger, a summer jacket, the kind that barmen wear. A dead rose hung from the buttonhole. Laying the jacket reverently on the desk, Turner opened the top drawers. Have you got a diary like this? he asked Gaunt. It was bound in blue rexine and stamped in gold with the royal crest. No, I haven't. Poor Gaunt. Too humble. He was turning the pages, working back. Once he stopped and frowned. Once he wrote something in his black notebook. It was counsel isn't above for that diary, that's why. I wouldn't accept one. He offered you one, did he? That was another of his fiddles, I suppose. Closing the diary, he pulled open the lower drawers. What if he did? You've no call to go rifling through his desk there, have you? Not for a little thing like that, pinching a handful of diaries. Well, that's hardly all the world, is it? His Welsh accent had jumped all the hurdles and was running free. He wasn't a bad man at all. Abandoning the desk, 
Turner opened the cupboard again and noted the printed number on the soles of the rubber overshoes. He said to me, John, he said, I like to make my contribution. And he did. He was proud of his work these last months. It was beautiful, wonderful to see. John, he'd say, I can't work when there's bustle. I can't stand it. I love peace and quiet, to be truthful. I'm not as young as I was, and that's a fact. I had a bag with him already. Thermos, maybe a sandwich. Very efficient man he was, handy. Work half the night sometimes, wouldn't he? All night, even. Turner's pale, pale eyes rested on Gaunt's dark face. Would he, though? He dropped the shoes back into the cupboard and they clattered absurdly in the silence. Signed the night book, too, did he? Gaunt faltered, waking at long last to the full menace in that quiet, destructive monotone. Turner slammed together the wooden doors of the cupboard. Or oh, didn't you bloody well bother? Well, not right, really, is it? You can't come over all official, not to a nice man like Leo. A dip, too, at that. Let him come and go as he pleased in the middle of the bloody night, didn't you? Wouldn't have been respectful to check up at all, would it? Such a friendly fellow. Pity to spoil it with formalities. Wouldn't be Christian, that wouldn't. No idea what time he left the building, I suppose. Two o'clock, four o'clock. Gaunt had to keep very still to catch the words. They were so softly spoken. It's nothing bad, is it? And that bag of his, Turner continued, in the same terribly low key. It wouldn't have been proper to look inside, I suppose. Open the thermos, for instance. The Lord wouldn't fancy that, would he? Don't you worry, Gaunt. It's nothing bad. Nothing that a prayer and a cup of tea won't cure. He was at the door, and Gaunt had to watch him. He pushed open the door. He's on compassionate leave, and don't you forget it, or you'll be in hotter water than you are already. In the registry, Meadows was waiting for him. He looked haggard and deeply tired. He did not move as Turner came towards him, pushing his way between the desks and files, but watched him dully and with contempt. Why did they have to send you? Haven't they got anyone else? Who are you going to wreck this time? They stood in a small sanctum, a steel-lined tank which served both as a strong room and an office. Of all the people I swore I'd never see again. Turner was at the top of the list. All right, all right. You're not the only one. Let's get it over, shall we? They sat down. She doesn't know you're here, said Meadows. I'm not going to tell her you're here. All right. He met her a few times. There was nothing between them. I'll keep away from her. Yes. He did not speak to Turner, but passed him at the lockers. Yes, you must. Try and forget it's me, all right? Take your time. For a moment, Turner's expression seemed to yield as the shadows formed upon his plain complexion until in its way his face was as old as Meadows and as weary. I'll tell it to you once, Meadows said, and that's all. I'll tell you all I know, and then you clear out. Turner nodded. How long have you been here? A year. Yes, a year now. Straight from Warsaw. We did a spell in London in between. Then they sent me here. I was 58. I had two more years to run. And after what happened in Warsaw, I reckoned I'd take things quietly. I wanted to cure her, get her right again. I understand. I thought he had his eye on Myra, to be honest, Meadows said. I watched out for that. I don't mind admitting. But there wasn't a breath of it, not on either side. Goodness knows I'm sharp enough on that after Warsaw. I believe you are. I don't care whether you believe me or not. It's the truth I'm telling you. He had a reputation for the girls as well, did he? A bit. Who was he going with? I'll go on with the story if you don't mind, Meadows said, looking at his hands. I'm not going to pass on that kind of muck, least of all to you. There's more nonsense talked in this place than is good for any of us. I'll find out. 
Turner said, his face frozen like a dead man's. It'll take me longer, but that needn't worry you. One day he takes me aside. Arthur, a quiet word, he says. That's him, a quiet word. You know the way he talks. No, I don't. Confiding. Everyone's special. Arthur, he says. Rawley Bradfield just sent for me. They want me to move up to registry and give you a hand up there, and before I tell him yes or no, I'd like to hear what you feel. Putting it in my hands, you see. If I didn't fancy the idea, he'd head it off. That's what he was hinting at. Well, it came as a surprise. I don't mind telling you. I didn't quite know what to think. After all, he was a, a second secretary. It didn't seem right. That was my first reaction. And to be frank, I wasn't sure I believed him. So I asked him, uh, well, had you any experience of archives, Leo? Yes, he had, but long ago, he said. So he'd always fancied going back to them. When was that then? When was what? When he was dealing with archives. Berlin, I suppose. I never asked. He didn't ask Leo about his background, really. You never knew what you might hear. So here he was with this suggestion. It didn't seem right, but what could I say? Well, it's up to Bradfield, I told him. If he sends you and you want to come, there's work enough. Well, it worried me for a bit, to be honest. I even thought of talking to Bradfield about it, but I didn't. Best thing is, I thought, let it blow over. I'll probably hear no more of it. And for a time, that's just what happened. Myra was bad again. And there was the leadership crisis at home and the gold row in Brussels. And as for Carfelt, he was going hammer and tongs all over the place. There were deputations out from England, trade union protests, old comrades, I don't know what. Registry was a beehive, and Leo Harting went clean out of my mind. I mean, he didn't rate. There was too much else to think of, I guess. The next thing I knew was Bradfield sends for me. It was just before the holiday, about the 20th of December. First, he asks me how I'm getting along with the destruction program. I was a bit put out. We'd really been going in those last months. Destruction was about the last thing anyone had been bothering with. Go carefully now. I want the fat as well as the lean. I said it was hanging fire. Well, he says, how would I feel if he sent me someone to help out with it, come and work in registry and bring it up to date? There'd been the suggestion, he said, nothing definite, and if he wanted to sound me out first, there'd been the suggestion Harting might be able to lend a hand. Whose suggestion? He didn't say. It was suddenly upon them and each in his way was mystified. Whoever suggested anything to Bradfield? It makes no sense. That's rather what I wondered. So you said you'd have him? No, I told him the truth. I said I didn't need him. You didn't need him. You told Bradfield that. Don't press me like that. Bradfield knew very well I didn't need anyone. Not for destruction, anyway. I'd been on to library in London. I'd spoken to them back in November. That was once the car felt panic began. I'd told them I was worried about the program. I was way behind. Could I let it go till the crisis was over? Library told me to forget it. Turner stared at him. And Bradfield knew that. You're certain Bradfield knew? I'd sent him a minute of the conversation. He never even referred to it. Afterwards, I asked that PA of his, and she was certain she'd put it up to him. Where is it? Where's the minute now? Gone. It was a loose minute. It was Bradfield's responsibility whether he preserved it or not. But they'll know about it in library, all right. They were quite surprised later on to find we bothered with destruction at all. Who did you speak to in library? Once to Maxwell, once to Cowdery. Did you remind Bradfield of that? I began to, but he just cut me off. Closed right down on me. It's all arranged, he says. Harting's joining you mid-January, and he'll manage personalities and destruction. So lump it, in other words. You can forget he's a diplomat, he said. Treat him as your subordinate. Treat him how you like. But he's coming mid-January, and that's a fact. 
You know how he throws people away, especially hearty. Turner was writing in his notebook, but Meadows paid no attention. So that's how he came to me. That's the truth. I didn't want him. I didn't trust him, not completely anyway. And to begin with, I suppose I'll let him know it. We were just too busy. I didn't want to waste time breaking in a man like Leo. What was I supposed to do with him? I said to Leo when he came, Leo, look, just keep out of the way. Don't get between my feet and don't go bothering other people. Oh, he took it like a lamb. Right, oh, Arthur, he says, whatever you say. I asked him whether he'd got something to get on with. Yes, he said, personalities would keep him going for a bit. It's like a dream, Turner said softly, looking up at last from his notebook. It's a lovely dream. First of all, he cons you, then he cons Bradfield, and within a couple of months, he's got the pick of registry. How was he? Cocky? I should think he couldn't hardly stand up for laughing. He was quiet, not cocky at all. Subdued, I'd say. Not at all what they told me he was like. Who? Oh, I don't know. There's a lot didn't like him. There's a lot more were jealous of him. Jealous? Of Leo? Well, he was a diplomat, wasn't he? Even if he was a temporary. They said he'd be running the place in a fortnight, taking 10% on the files. You know the way they talk. But he changed. They all admitted that, even young Cork and Johnny Flingo. You could almost date it, they said, from when the crisis began. It sobered him down. Meadows shook his head as if he hated to see a good man go wrong. And he was useful. Don't tell me. He took you by surprise. He took to the job like a duck to water. I was amazed. He was happy. That was the first thing. It tickled him, working in here. And quite soon it tickled me having him. He liked the company. The only thing we ever really minded was those ruddy cigars he smoked. Javanese Dutch, I believe they were. Stank the place up. We used to tease him about them, but he wouldn't budge. Still, I think I miss them now. He'd been out of his depth in Chancery. He's not their sort at all. And the ground floor didn't have much time for him either, in my opinion. But this place was just right. He inclined his head towards the closed door. It's like a shop in there sometimes. You have the customers and you have one another. Johnny Slingo, Valerie, well, they took to him too, and that's all there is to it. They were all against him when he came. They all took to him within a week, and that's the truth of it. He's got away with him, Leo. I know what you're thinking. It flattered my ego, I suppose you're going to say. All right. It did. Everyone wants to be liked, and he liked it. All right, I'm lonely. Myra's a worry. I've failed as a parent, and I've never had a son. There was a bit of that about it, too, I suppose, although there's only ten years between us. Perhaps it's him being, well, being little that makes the difference. Go for the girls, did he? Turner asked, more to break the uncomfortable silence than because he had been preparing questions in his mind. Only banter. Ever hear of a woman called Aikman? No. Margaret Aikman. They were engaged to be married, her and Leo, once. No. Did he ever mention politics? No. What did he say about Carfelt? Oh, he was concerned, naturally. That's why he was so glad to be helping out. Oh, sure. It was trust, Meadows said defiantly. You wouldn't understand that. Did he ever mention a man called Prushko in the Bundestag? He, he said one night that Prushko had walked out on him. How? Walked out how? Oh, he wouldn't say. He said they'd emigrated to England together and returned here together after the war. Prushko had chosen one path and Leo had chosen another. He shrugged. I didn't press him. Why should I? After that night, he never mentioned him again. Then we had this green. A green's rare. I don't know what's in it. Johnny doesn't, Valerie doesn't. It lives in its own dispatch box. H.E.'s got one key, Bradfield's got the other, and he shares it with Delisle. 
The box has to come back here to the strong room every night. It's signed in and signed out, and only I handle it. So anyway, lunchtime, Wednesday it was. Leo was up here on his own. Johnny and me went down to the canteen. Often here on his own, lunch times, was he? He liked to be, yes, he liked the quiet. All right. There was a big queue at the canteen. I can't stand queuing, so I said to Johnny, you stay here, I'll go back and do a spot of work and try again in half an hour. So I came in unexpectedly, just walked in. No Leo, and the strong room door opened. And there he was, standing there with the green dispatch box. What do you mean, with it? Just holding it, looking at the lock as far as I could make out, just curious. He smiled when he saw me, cool as anything. He's sharp, I've told you that. Arthur, he says, you've caught me at it. You've discovered my guilty secret. I said, what the hell are you up to? Look what you've got there in your hand, just like that. You know me, he says, very disarming. I just can't help it. He puts down the box. I was actually looking for some 707s. You don't happen to have seen them anywhere, do you, for March and February 58, something like that. So then what? I read in the riot act. What else could I do? I said I'd report him to Bradfield a lot. I was furious. But you didn't. No. Why not? You wouldn't understand. You think I'm soft in the head, I know. It was Mara's birthday Friday. We were having a special do. Leo had choir practice and a dinner party. Dinner party? Where? He didn't say. There's nothing in his diary says dinner party. That's not my concern. Go on. He promised to drop in sometime during the evening and give Myra her present. It was going to be a hairdryer. We'd chosen it together. He shook his head again. How can I explain it? I've told you. I felt responsible for him. He was that kind of bloke. You and I could blow him over with one puff if we wanted. Turner was writing in his flat notebook. Tell me what is missing with him, he said at last. Meadows unlocked a drawer at his desk and drew out a list of references. His movements were brisk and surprisingly confident. Bradfield didn't tell you? No. Meadows handed him the list. There's 43 of them. They're all box files. They've all disappeared since March. The security classifications vary from confidential to top secret, but the majority are plain secret. There's organization files, conference, personality, two treaty files. The subjects range from the dismantling of chemical concerns in the Ruhr in 1947 to minutes of unofficial Anglo-German exchanges at working level over the last three years, plus the green and that's formal and informal conversations, Bradfield told me. They're like pieces, believe me. They're like pieces in a puzzle. That's what I thought at first. I've moved them round in my mind, hour after hour. I haven't slept. Now and then, now and then I thought I had an idea, a sort of picture. A half picture, I say. But there's no clear pattern to it. No, there's no reason to it. Some are marked out by Leo to different people. Some are marked certified for destruction. But most are just plain missing. You can't tell, you see. You can't keep tabs. It's impossible. Until someone asks for the file, you don't know you haven't got it. Box files? I told you. All 43. They weigh a couple of hundred weights between them, I should think. And the letters? There are letters missing, too. Yes. We're short of 33 incoming letters. Never entered, were they? Just lying about for anyone to pick up. What were the subjects? You haven't put it down. We don't know. That's the truth. They're letters from local German departments. We know the references because the bag room's written them in the log. They never reached registry. But you've checked the references. The missing letters belong to the missing files. The references are the same. That's all we can tell. As they're from German departments here in Bonn, Bradfield has ruled that we do not ask for duplicates until the Brussels decision is through, in case our curiosity alerts them to Harting's absence. 
Having returned his black notebook to his pocket, Turner rose and went to the barred window, touching the lock, testing the strength of the wire mesh. There was something about him. He was special. Something made you watch him. All the time you've been talking, I've heard it. Leo this, Leo that. You've had your eye on him. You've felt him. I know you did. Why? There was nothing. What were these rumours? What was it they said about him that frightened you, Arthur? Was he somebody's fancy boy? Something for Johnny Slingo, was he, in his old age? Working the queer circuit, was he? Is that what all the blushing's for? Meadows shook his head. You've lost your sting. You can't frighten me anymore. I know you. I know your work. It's nothing to do with Warsaw. He wasn't that kind. I'm not a child, and Johnny's not a homosexual either. Turner continued to stare at him. There's something you heard, something you knew. You watched him, I know you did. You watched him cross a room, how he stood, how he reached for a file. He was doing the silliest bloody job in registry, and you talk about him as if he was the ambassador. There was chaos in here, you said so yourself. Everyone except Leo chasing files, making up, entering, connecting, all standing on your heads to keep the ball rolling in a crisis. What was Leo doing? Leo was on destruction. He could have been making bloody flax for all his work mattered. You said so, not me. So what was it about him? Why did you watch him? You're dreaming. You're twisted and you can't see anything straight. But if by any chance you were right, I wouldn't even whisper it to you on my desk. The American club in Bonn was not as heavily guarded as the embassy. It's no one's gastronomic dream, Delisle explained, as he showed his papers to the G.I. at the door. He had booked a window overlooking the Rhine. With elaborate diffidence, he pointed out the Petersberg, a regular wooded cone capped by a rectangular hotel. Neville Chamberlain had stayed there in the 30s, he explained. That was when he gave away Czechoslovakia, of course. The first time, I mean. Where's Harting's house? You can't quite see it, Delisle said. Harting had a dinner party on Friday night, Turner said. Did he? But it wasn't marked in his diary. Silly man. Delisle peered round, but no one came. Where is that wretched waiter? Where was Bradfield on Friday night? Shut up, said Delisle. I don't like that kind of thing. Compelled, apparently, by a single urge, the foreign correspondents had left their bar and were floating in a long shoal towards the centre table already prepared for them. A very large man, catching sight of Delisle, pulled a long strand of black hair over his right eye and extended his arm in a Nazi greeting. Delisle lifted his glass in reply. That's Sam Allerton, he explained in an aside. He really is rather a pig. It was three o'clock. A white sun had broken through the clouds. Turner and Delisle sat in the garden of the American club under beech umbrellas, sipping their brandy and watching the diplomatic daughters volley and laugh in the wet red clay of the tennis court. Trashko, I suspect, is a baddie, Delisle declared. We used to have him on the books long ago, but he went sour on us. He yawned. Trashko was quite dangerous in his day. A political pirate. He's a free democrat, you know. Or did Rawley tell us? That's a home for lost causes, if ever there was one. They've got some very weird creatures in that party. But he was a friend. You are innocent, Delisle said drowsily. Like Leo. We can know people all our lives without becoming friends. 
We can know people five minutes and they're our friends for life. Is Prashko so important? He's all I've got, said Tony. He's all I've got to go on. He's the only person I've heard of who knew him outside the embassy. He was going to be best man at Leo's wedding. Wedding? Leo? Delisle sat bolt upright, his composure gone. He was engaged long ago to somebody called Margaret Aikman. They seemed to have known each other in Leo's pre-embassy days. Delisle fell back in apparent relief. If you're thinking of approaching Prashko, he said, I'm not, don't worry. That's one message I have got. He drank. But somebody tipped Leo off. Somebody did. You're going to advance a theory. I can hear it ticking. Well, here's something for your little notebook. What do you make of this? One gorgeous winter afternoon. I'd been to a boring conference, and it was half past four. I'd nothing much to do, so I took myself for a drive up into the hills behind Godesberg. It was beautiful. Sun, frost, a bit of snow. And suddenly, there was Leo. Indisputably, unquestionably Leo shrouded to the ears in falcon black with one of those dreadful Homburg hats they wear in the movement. He was standing at the edge of a football field, watching some kids kicking a ball and smoking one of those little cigars everyone complained about. Alone. All alone. I thought of stopping, but I didn't. He hadn't any car that I could see, and he was miles from anywhere, and suddenly I thought, no, don't stop, he's at church. He's looking for the childhood he never had. You were fond of him, weren't you? Delisle might have replied, but he was interrupted by an unexpected intruder. Hello? New flunky? The voice was slurred and gritty, as its owner was standing directly in the sun. Turner had to screw up his eyes in order to make him out at all. At length, he discerned the gently swaying outline and the black, unkempt hair of the English journalist who had saluted them at lunch. He was pointing at Turner, but his question, to judge by the cast of his head, was addressed to Delisle. What is he? Pimp or spy? Which do you want to be, Alan? Delisle asked cheerfully, but Turner declined to answer. Alan Turner, Sam Allerton, he continued, quite unbothered. Sam represents a lot of newspapers, don't you, Sam? He's enormously powerful. Not that he cares for power, of course. Journalists never do. Allerton continued to stare at Turner. How long's he here for? Just visiting. I know what his visits are, said Allerton. He's a bloodhound. Security Turner, that's who you are. You did a job in Warsaw, didn't you? I remember that, too. That was a balls up, wasn't it? Some girl tried to kill herself. Somebody you'd been too rough with. Run away, Sam, said Delisle. Allerton began laughing, but left without further comment. The little sports car nosed its way slowly down the sanitary arcades of the American colony. A church bell, much amplified, was celebrating the sunlight. That lift, Turner said suddenly, in the embassy, how long's it been out of action? Oh, God, when was anything? Mid-April, I suppose. You sure of that? You're thinking of the trolley, aren't you, which also disappeared in mid-April. You're not bad. You're not bad at all. <laughs> and you would be making a most terrible mistake if you ever thought you were a specialist, Delisle retorted. He put P in his diary, Turner said. After Christmas, meet P, give P dinner, then it faded out again. It could have been Prashko. Could have been. He went to a conference every Thursday afternoon. Which one would that be? Delisle pulled up at the traffic lights, and Carfelt frowned down on them like a cyclops, one eye ripped off by a dissenting hand. I don't think he did go to a conference. Delisle said cautiously. Not recently, anyway. What do you mean? 
Well, until Rawley came, it's true, he attended a low-level conference at the building ministry. Until Bradfield came. Yes. Then what happened? The conference had run down, had it? Like the rest of his work. More or less. What do you mean, more or less? Take care, Delisle warned him, lifting one hand from the steering wheel. Don't rush in. Rawley sent me instead of him. He didn't like the embassy to be represented by someone like Leo. Someone like, by a temporary, that's all. By a temporary without full status. Turner was not shouting. It was rather the massive slowness of his speech which gave it urgency. You make me puke. All of you. The whole sodding circus. Where the hell did he go on Thursday afternoons if he didn't go to the ministry? Who ran him? Who protected him? Who gave him his orders and his money and took his information off him? Who held his hand? He's a spy, for Christ's sake. He's put his hand in the till. And the moment you find out, you're all on his side. They entered the car park and Delisle drove round to the canteen side where Turner had stood that morning staring across the field. I've got to see his house, Turner said. I've got to. They were both looking ahead of them through the windscreen. I thought you'd ask me that. All right, forget it. Why should I? I've no doubt you'll go anyway, sooner or later. I'll pick you up from your hotel, 5 a.m., Wednesday. On the desk in the day room was a blue embassy envelope addressed to Alan Turner, Esquire. The writer was Miss Jenny Pargeter of Press and Information Section, presently on attachment to Chancery. I assume, Jenny Pargeter began, as if in a prepared statement, that you are used to dealing in delicate matters. The sherry stood between them on the glass-topped sofa table. Oh, sure. Supposing someone, supposing I myself, had been injudicious in a personal matter. It depends who you've been injudicious with, Turner replied. And Jenny Pargeter coloured suddenly. That is not what I meant at all. Turner put down his glass and opened his notebook. I arrived here just before Christmas, from London. As a single woman in an embassy, one is very often overcome with invitations at Christmas. Almost everyone in Chancery invited me to spend the festive days with them. The Bradfields, the Crabs, the Jacksons, the Gavisons, they all asked me. I was also invited by the Meadows. I accepted Meadows' invitation. The other guest was Harting. We spent a pleasant day, stayed there till evening, then left. And as we were leaving, Harting suggested we went for a walk. He knew a place not far away, a playing field. It would be nice to drive up there and get some fresh air after so much food and drink. I'm very fond of exercise. We had our walk, and then he proposed I should go back with him for supper. He was very insistent. And to my surprise, I found that he had prepared everything for my arrival. The table was laid for two. And after supper, he told me that he loved me. What did you say? I had no chance to say anything. He wished to give me a present. Even if he never saw me again, he wished me to have this Christmas gift as a token of his love. He disappeared into the study and came back with a parcel, all wrapped up and ready with a label. To my love. I was naturally completely at a loss. What was in the parcel? Um, a hair dryer. A hair dryer to dry my hair. He said he admired my hair above everything. I, I said I had to go home. He saw me to the car. He was very correct. Fortunately, we had two more days of holiday. I was able to decide what to do. I wrote him a letter and returned the gift. I felt no other course was open to me. So you gave him the bird. What did Leo do about it? I next saw him in Chancery meeting, and he wished me a good morning as if nothing had happened. I smiled at him, and that was that. 
He was pale, but brave. Sad, but in command. I felt that the worst was over. Fortunately, he was about to begin a new job in Chancery Registry, and I hoped that this would take his mind off, off other things. So you were friends again. He watched her search for the wrong words, watched her balance awkwardly at the edge of truth, and awkwardly withdraw. Since Thursday, the 23rd of January, he has not spoken to me again, she blurted. And even in that sad light, Turner saw the tears running down her rough cheeks as her head fell forward and her hand rose quickly to cover them. I can't go on. I think of him all the time. She lay across the chair, her head buried in the crook of her elbow, her shoulders shaking to the rhythm of her sobbing. You've got to tell me, Turner said. He was standing over her, his hand on her arm. Listen, you've got to tell me what happened at the end of January. It was something important, wasn't it? Something he asked you to do for him, something political. Something special you're afraid of. First of all, he made up to you. He worked on you, took you by surprise. Then he got what he wanted. Something very simple he couldn't get for himself. Then when he'd got it, he didn't want you anymore. The sobbing continued. Tell me. It was something that frightened the life out of you. Tell me what it was. Oh, God. I lent him the keys. I lent him the keys, she said. The duty officers. The whole bunch. He came to me and begged me. No, <laughs> he didn't beg. Not beg, no. She was sitting up, white in the face. Turner refilled her glass and put it back in her hand. He was so little. You could hurt him so easily. I loved him. I swear I've never loved anyone. Gradually her crying stopped. So you gave him the keys, the whole bunch. But I had to trust him. It was an act of giving, don't you see? An act of giving, an act of love. How can I expect a man to understand that? And after you'd given, he didn't want you anymore, did he? It's like all men, isn't it? Did he ever mention a woman to you, a Margaret Aikman? He was engaged to her. He was going to marry her. She knew Harry Prashko as well. No. What did he say about Prashko? He said Prashko was the only friend he'd ever had. She broke down again, and again he waited. Somebody had lunch with Harting last Thursday, the day before he left, at the maternal. Was that you? I told you. I swear to you. Was it? No! He's marked it down as you. It's marked P. That's how he wrote you down at the times. It wasn't me. Then it was Prashko, wasn't it? How should I know? Because you had an affair with him. You told me half and not the rest. You were sleeping with him up to the day he left. She was at the door. What will you do when you find him? She asked with that slack voice that follows passion. We never will find him. So it doesn't matter, does it? Then why look for him? Why not? That's how we spend our lives, isn't it? Looking for people we'll never find. Turner signed for the duty officer's keys and by ten o'clock that night had visited every room to which Harting had acquired access. He had gained nothing but a headache for his trouble. Whatever Harting wanted was no longer there, or else so hidden as to require weeks of searching, or so obvious as to be invisible. Turner resumed his study of the diary. What did Leo Harting do each Thursday? Something he kept quiet about, buried. 
something urgent and constructive, something secret, something that made all the other days worthwhile, something to believe in. On Thursdays, Leo Harting touched the hem and kept his mouth shut. Not even the weekly lie was recorded. Only last Thursday carried an entry at all, and that read, Maternus, one o'clock, P. All Harting's life took place that day. He had lived from Thursday to Thursday as others lived from year to year. What kind of meeting did they have, Harting and his master? What kind of relationship, after all these years of collaboration, where did they meet? Where did he unpack those files and letters and breathlessly recite his intelligence? Was it with Prashko, then, that he had lunched at the Maternus? If so, Prashko could hardly be his regular contact, for he would not add the tell-tale P, that Harting who covered his tracks so well, and would not lunch with Prashko in public either, for the trouble he had taken to sever his relationship. Was there in that case a middleman, a cutout between Prashko and Harting, or was this the day the system failed? Hold the line, Turner. Hold on to reason, for unreason will be your downfall. Make order out of chaos. Was this P the sign that Prushko proposed to see him in person, to warn him, perhaps, that Siegkron was on his trail, to order him, here was a chance, to order him at any risk and at all costs, to steal the green file before he ran? Turner lifted the keys and swung them gently from his finger. Thursday was the day for meeting, fresher day, the day he was warned, the day before he left the day of the weekly briefing and debriefing, the day he borrowed the keys from Jenny Pargita. Christ, had he really slept with Pargita? There are certain sacrifices, commissar, controller, which not even Leo Harting will make for the service of Mother Russia. The useless keys. What did he suppose he would get from them? Entry to the coveted dispatch box? False. He would have observed the procedure. Meadows had even instructed him in it. He would know very well that there were no spare keys to the dispatch box and the duty officer's bunch. Entry to the registry itself, then? False again. He would know at a glance that registry was protected with better locks than these. So what key did he want? What key did he want so desperately that he imperiled his whole career as a spy in order to get a copy of it? What key did he want? that he made up to Jenny Pargita and risked the disapproval of the embassy, incurred it indeed, if Meadows and Gaunt were anything to go by. What key? The key to the lift, so that he could smuggle out his files, dump them in some hideaway on an upper floor, and remove them singly and at leisure in his briefcase. Was that what the missing trolley meant? It was absurd. No questions. He knew it was absurd. Spies of Harting's caliber do not steal. They record, memorize, photograph. Spies of Harting's caliber act by graph and calculation, not by impulse. They cover their tracks and survive to deceive again tomorrow. He wanted privacy. He wanted to do things by night that he could not do by day. What thing? Use his camera in some remote room where he had concealed the files, where he could turn the lock upon himself. Where was the trolley? Or was the disappearance, as Meadows had assumed, really unconnected with Harting? At present, there was only one answer. Harting had hidden the files in a cache during the day. He had photographed them at night in privacy and had returned them the next morning except that he hadn't returned them. So why steal? A spy does not steal, rule one. An embassy discovering a loss can change its plans, remake or revoke treaties, take a dozen prophylactic measures to anticipate and minimize the harm that has been done. The best girl is the girl you don't have. The most effective deceit is the deceit which is never discovered. Then why steal? The reason was already clear. Harting was under pressure. Calculated though his actions might be, they had all the marks of a man racing against time. So what was the hurry? What was the deadline? 
either alone or as a result of Plushko's persuasion, Leo determines to betray. Plushko approaches him, the green vial. Get the green vial and our old cause will be served. Get the green vial by decision day in Brussels. The contents of that vial, Bradfield had said, could effectively compromise our entire posture in Brussels. Or was Leo being blackmailed? Was that the nature of the race? Must Leo choose between satisfying a greedy master or being compromised by an unknown indiscretion. It was not in character. There was a thrust, a driving purpose to Harting's actions which went beyond self-preservation. Harting was not oppressed, but an oppressor, a hunter, a pursuer. Was Leo blackmailing Bradfield? Turner asked that question suddenly, sitting up quite straight. Was that the explanation of Bradfield's reluctant protection? Was that why Bradfield had found him work in registry, allowed him to vanish without explanation on Thursday afternoons to wander around the corridors with a briefcase? He looked once more at the diary and thought, question fundamentals. Why Thursday at all? Why the afternoon? Why regular meetings, however desperate, why did Harting meet his contact in the daylight, in working hours, in Godesberg, when his absence from the embassy had to be the occasion of a lie in the first place? It was absurd. Balls, Turner, such as they are. As he walked into the corridor, feeling giddy and very stiff, he asked himself once more, what secrets are kept in the magic green fire? And who the hell is going to tell me? Turner, a temporary. It was still dark when Peter Delisle collected Turner on Wednesday morning. They passed a village and another. Soon the large white house loomed before them. The lower windows were shuttered, the front gates open. Park up the road and come back. I think I'll just park up the road. How long will you need? You know the house. Come and help me. Not my form, sorry. I don't mind bringing you, but I'm not coming in. Keeping to the grass verge, Turner followed the drive towards the house. About to insert the key, he heard a footstep. Unmistakably, a footstep. Peter? He's changed his mind again, he thought. He's being soft-hearted. Peter! There was no answer. Turning the key, he pushed open the door hard, then stood still and listened again, while the faint aroma of stale cigar smoke rose lovingly to his nostrils. He waited, letting the room come to him out of the cold gloom. He walked slowly from room to room. The dining table was laid for two. Over it lay a thin layer of dust. He wrote quickly in his notebook, then continued to the kitchen. He had never seen so many gadgets. Mixers, cutters, toasters, openers. On a white plate, two steaks were set side by side. Strips of garlic had been threaded into the flesh. He prepared it on the Thursday night, he thought suddenly. On Thursday night, he still didn't know he was going to defect on Friday. The upstairs corridor was carpeted with thin runners of coconut matting. He pulled out suits one by one thrusting his hands into the pockets, then throwing them aside as if they were spent. He heard another footfall. Dropping the suit, he sprang to the window. He heard it again, twice. Twice he had heard the solid tread of feet. Pushing back the shutter, he leaned into the twilight and stared down at the driveway. Peter? Was it the dark that moved? Or a man? Peter? Nothing. No car, no guard. The neighboring houses lay still in the darkness. Above him, Chamberlain's mountain woke slowly to the dawn. He closed the window. Turner worked faster now. He had come upon a suit of dark blue gabardine. Laying it on the bed, he felt in the pockets and drew out a brown envelope carefully folded upon itself. In it was a gray, 
shotgun metal key. Turner put it carefully between the pages of his notebook. In a drawer, he found a box. It was a square, hard box by the feel of it, bound in a black silk handkerchief, wrapped like a parcel and pinned upon itself. Unfastening the pins, he cautiously drew out a tin of dull, silvery metal. He emptied the contents onto the handkerchief. Five buttons lay before him. They were each about one inch in diameter, wooden, and handmade to the same pattern, crudely but with the greatest care, as if the maker wanted for instruments but not for application, and they were pierced twice, generously, to admit a very broad thread. Turner studied them with the greatest concentration, so that only instinct made him swing round and face the tall figure in the doorway. He was an elderly man. He wore a tunic and a peaked cap of the kind that German students used to wear or merchant sailors in the First World War. His face was dark with coal dust. Turner ventured a pace forward. Good morning, he said. One black hand rose mechanically to the peak of his hat. Turner shouted at the top of his voice, Don't lie out! The echo carried wildly into the deserted street and outwards to the river. Turner had pulled open the wooden shutters to let in the new daylight, and now the three of them stood in a baffled group. Who is he? The boiler man. We all have them. Ask him when he last saw Harton. The old man's voice was timeless, a slow peasant drawl. He comes at five in the evening on the way home, and first thing in the morning on the way to work. He stokes the boilers, does the dustings and the empties. Ask him again, when did he last see Harting? Here. Turner produced a 50-mark note. Show him this. Say I'll give it to him if he tells me what I want to know. Seeing the money, the old man examined Turner carefully with his dry red eyes. Friday, Delisle quietly interpreted. His eye was on the window and he seemed distracted. Leo paid him on Friday afternoon. He went round to his house and paid him on the doorstep. He says he has something to show us, something that is worth another 50 marks. The old man was glancing quickly from one to the other of them. He cautiously detached something from round his neck. And as he did so, he began murmuring again, but faster than before, nervous and voluble. He found it on Saturday morning in the rubbish. It was a holster made of green webbing, army issue, suitable for a 3 8 pistol. It had Harting Leo stenciled on the inside, and it was empty. In the dustbin, right on top, said Delisle. But by then the cars had entered the drive, and the little room was filled with the double wail of a police horn and the double flash of a blue light. The door was flung open, and a young man in a leather coat held a pistol in his hand. The boiler man was crying, wailing, waiting to be hit, and the blue light was rolling like a light for dancing. Do nothing, Delisle had said. Obey no orders. He was talking to the boy in the leather coat, offering his red diplomatic card for examination. His voice was quiet but very firm, a negotiator's voice, neither flippant nor concessive, stiffened with authority and hinting at injured privilege. The green uniforms dispersed, the blue lights vanished, the vans drove away. Delisle had found three glasses and was pouring a little whiskey into each. The old man was whimpering. Turner had returned the buttons to their tin and put the tin in his pocket together with the holster. He told you something else about a woman. I heard him say Frau and Auto, something about a woman and a car. Sorry, old boy, Delisle said coolly. It's the Rhineland accent. Sometimes it simply defeats you. I'm chasing a ghost, a bloody shadow. Your own, Delisle retorted, his voice rich with disgust. Oh, sure, sure. I shall drive you back to the embassy. From then on, you find your own transport. Why the hell did you bring me if you're so squeamish? <laughs> oh, 
Of course. What a bloody fool I am. I'm going to sleep. You were frightened I might find the green file. You thought you'd wait in the wings. Unsuitable for temporaries. Christ. Turner was standing in Bradfield's office. I've already spoken to Lumley. You go home tonight. I'd better go this afternoon, Turner suggested. He had not taken his eyes from Bradfield's face. I've ballsed it up, haven't I? Sorry about that. Sorry you're not satisfied with the service. I'll write and apologise. That's what Lumley likes me to do, a bread and butter letter. So I'll do that. I'll write. I seem to have been a bit of a Jonah. Best thing to do, really, chuck me out. Be a bit of a wrench for you, that will. You don't like getting rid of people, do you? Rather give them a contract. What's that supposed to mean? That's what I'm going to tell Lumley when I get back to the smoke. Harting didn't work alone. He had a patron as well as a controller, and for all I know, they were the same man. And for all I bloody well know, Leo Harting was Rawley Bradfield's fancy boy, having a bit of public school vice on the side. Bradfield was standing up, his face contracted with anger. Tell Lumley what you like, but get out of here and don't ever come back. And it was then that Mickey Crabb put his red, bubbling face round the door. Um, uh, Rawley, it's, it's about, um, Leo. Uh, I've just seen him down at the railway station. <laughs> um, bloody well having a beer. Bradfield had no time to be surprised. Was he carrying anything? Did he have a briefcase with him? Anything that could hold papers? Um, uh, didn't, didn't really see, Rawley, oh boy. Uh, sitting at a table, you see. <laughs> having a beer. Sorry. They stood in silence, all three, while Crabbe blinked from one face to the other. You did well, Bradfield muttered at last. All right, Crabbe. Thank you. Well, Turner shouted, he did bloody badly. Leo's not in quarantine. Why didn't he talk to him, drag him here by the neck, reason with him? He may be gone by now. That was our last chance. Did he have anyone with him? He pulled open the door and shouted. I said, did he have anyone with him? Come on! Bradfield did not move. For God's sake! I'm staying here. Crab has a car. Let him take you. Um, he was, he was sitting just, just there, Crab whispered. But by then Turner had flung open the glazed swing door and was standing inside the station restaurant, glaring through the cigarette smoke at each table in turn. A loudspeaker barked a message about changing at Cologne. Um, he's gone, Crabbe was saying. Uh, sod's flown. Three small cigar ends lay in the ashtray. One was still slightly smouldering. Crabbe was addressing the waitress. He was hanging over her whispering, and his hand was on the flesh of her upper arm. She nodded, proud to have remembered, the Kleiner here. Um, he was here till a few minutes ago, Crabbe said in some bewilderment. Her version, anyway. Hmm. What made him leave? Did he see someone? Did someone signal to him from the door? Um, you're, you're stretching it, old son. She didn't see him leave. She didn't worry about him, you see. He paid with every order, uh, as if he might be leaving in a hurry. Catch a train, you see. What's the matter, then? Why are you looking like that? It's, it's, it's bloody odd, Crabbe muttered, frowning absurdly. What's bloody odd? Look. He held out his hand. A wooden button lay in the palm and it was identical to the buttons in the scratched tin in Koenigswinter. She picked this up from the table, he said. She, she thought it might be something he needed. She was hanging on to it in case he came back, you see. Bradfield came slowly through the doorway. His face was taut but without expression. I gather he's not here. You still say you saw him? Oh, uh, no, no mistake, old oh boy. Um, I'm sorry, Rawley. 
Well, I suppose we must believe you. I suggest we go back to the embassy. Extraordinary place for Leo to spend the night, Crabbe muttered. But Turner was fingering the gunmetal key in his pocket and still wondering, for all his sense of failure, whose door it had unlocked. Turner picked up his ticket from travel section and went back to his hotel. He tried to open the door to his room, but the lock was jammed. He stepped back quickly when he heard the footsteps, but he didn't really have much chance. The door was pulled open from inside. He had a glimpse of a pale, round face and fair hair carefully combed back. A bland brow furrowed with anxiety. He saw the stitching of the leather as it moved down on him in slow motion. He felt the nausea strike him and his stomach fold. And then he was lying in a smooth coffin and Delisle's voice was offering comfort. My dear fellow, he was saying, as he peered curiously downward, I dropped in to say goodbye, but if you're going to take a bath, you might at least take off that dreadful suit. Is it Thursday? Delisle had taken a towel from the rail and was soaking it under the hot tap. Wednesday. Wednesday as ever was. Cocktail time. He bent over Turner and began gently dabbing the blood from his face. That football field. Where you saw him. Where he took Pargita. Tell me how I get up there. Keep still and don't talk or you'll wake your neighbours. Freeing his right hand, Turner cautiously felt in the pocket of his jacket for the gunmetal key. It was still there. Tomorrow's Thursday. If they don't know he's defected, they'll be expecting him to turn up, won't they? I suppose so. But then they know where to go, don't they, whoever they are, and you don't. That is something of a drawback. It might not be. It's no good telling you not to go, I suppose. No. Asking you. You're acting against Bradfield's instructions. Even so. And you're sick. All right. Go and look for your untamed heart. And if you do find that file, we shall expect you to return it unopened. And that, quite suddenly, was an order. The weather on the football field that Thursday was stolen from other seasons and other places. The cuts on Turner's face were burning raw, and his pale eyes were bright with sleepless pain. He waited, staring down the hill. He drew back quickly behind a tree. One opal record, two men, registration Bon. The men were wearing hats and overcoats and were professionally without expression. The car continued, but at a walking pace. Somewhere a clock chimed. Or was it a school bell? A little Citroen de Chevaux was wandering into sight. The opal disappeared. The Citroen had a diplomatic number plate. First the zero, meaning stateless. Then the five, meaning stateless but British. The Citroen stopped. She sat at the wheel, drumming her fingers. The engine was still running, shaking the car with inner pains. A wiper juddered uselessly over the grimy windscreen. For an hour, she barely moved. Her patience began to fade. She lit a cigarette. She slapped the horn with her open hand. Turner stepped heavily onto the path, grasped the handle, and pulled open the passenger door. Waiting for someone, he asked, and sat down beside her closing the door quickly so that the light went out again. He switched off the wireless. I thought you'd gone, she said hotly. I thought my husband had got rid of you. Fear, anger, humiliation seized hold of her. You've been spying on me all the time, crouching in the bushes like a detective. How dare you, you vulgar, bloody little man. For the first time, she saw the marks on his face by the interior light, and she drew her breath sharply. Who did that? They'll do it to Leo if they find him first. She was leaning back in the seat, her eyes closed. He waited. I'm a whore, she explained. That's what you're thinking. Every Thursday, here. 
He parked his car down the lane, and I left mine in the road. It was all very grown up. Don't tell me he admired your hair, too. He saw her face tilt and the smile break. Where did you do the rest, he asked. Raleigh's bed. He always knew when Raleigh was going away. Did Raleigh know? I should think so. I never asked him. Yes, he knew. Because it was you made Raleigh renew that contract, wasn't it? Last December. You worked on him. Yes, that was awful. That was quite awful, but it had to be done, she explained, as if she were referring to a higher cause of which they were both aware. Or he'd have sent Leo away. Leo never mentioned one Margaret Aikman to you, I suppose. He was going to marry her once, you know. She was the only woman he loved. He never loved anyone but me. But he didn't mention her. He did to other people, you see, everyone except you. She was his big love. I don't believe it, and I'll never believe it. Turner got out of the car and leaned in towards her. You're all right, aren't you? You've touched the hem. He loved you. The whole bloody world can go to war as long as you have your little boy. Yes, I've touched the hem. He was real with me. I made him real. He's real whatever he's doing now, and that was our time. And I'm not going to let you destroy it. You or anyone else. He found me. What else did he find? He found me. And whatever he found down there was the other part of coming alive. Down? Down where? Where did he go? Tell me. You know. What was it he said to you? She drove away, not looking back, quite slowly, into the evening and the small lights. The opal drew out from nowhere, preparing to follow her. Turner let it pass. The embassy car park was full. The guard was doubled at the gate. Once more, the ambassador's Rolls Royce waited at the door like an ancient ship to bear him to the storm. As Turner ran up the steps, his raincoat flying behind him, he held the key ready in his hand. Who's duty officer? He snapped. I thought you'd gone, said Gaunt. Seven o'clock yesterday, that's what... I want the keys. Gaunt saw the cut on Turner's face and his eyes opened wide. I've got them here, in the safe, but you can't have them, not without a signature. You know that very well. I don't want them. I want you to count them, that's all. How many should there be? Forty-seven. Gaunt unlocked the safe that was built into the corner and drew out the familiar bunch of bright-cut brass keys. He counted them once, and he counted them a second time. Well, forty-six, no doubt. When were they last counted? It was hardly possible to say. They'd been going in and out for weeks. Turner pointed to the shining new grill that cut off the basement stairway. How do I get down there? I told you. Bloodfield has the key. It's a riot gate, see? Guards don't have the authority. How do the cleaners get down there, then? What about the boiler men? Oh, the boiler room's separate access now. Ever since Bremen, see? They put grills down there as well. They can use the outside stairs, but they can't go no further than that, on account of being prevented. Gaunt was very scared. There's a fire escape, a service lift. Only the back staircase, but that's locked too, see, locked. And the keys? With Bradfield, same as for the lift. Where does it lead from? Top floor? Show me. I'll settle for twins, said Cork to Meadows, as Valerie brought in the tea. Meadows had actually raised the mug to his lips when he heard the sound of a trolley and the familiar trill of the squeaky wheel. Valerie put down the tray with a bang, and some tea slopped out of the pot into the sugar bowl. It was their own trolley, loaded high with red and black files, and Alan Turner was pushing it. He was in his shirt sleeves, and there were heavy bruises under both his eyes. One lip was cut clean through and had been summarily stitched. He had not shaved. 
The dispatch box was on the top of the pile. Cork said later that he looked as though he had pushed the trolley through enemy lines single-handed. As he came down the passage, doors opened one after another in his wake. Crab, Pargita, Delisle. One by one, their heads appeared. And by the time he'd arrived at registry, slammed back the flap of the steel counter and shoved the trolley into the room, the only door that remained closed was that of Rawley Bradfield, head of Chancery. Leave it there. Don't touch it, any of it. Turner crossed the corridor and without knocking went straight into Bradfield. I thought you'd gone. I missed the plane, didn't she tell you? What the devil have you done to your face? Siebkron sent his men to search my room looking for news of Harting. I interrupted them. He sat down. The matter of Harting is closed. What the devil do you mean by remaining in Bonn when I told you to leave? Have you no idea what is going on here? It's Friday, the day of the demonstration, in case you'd forgotten. I've found the files. I've found the whole lot. And the trolley. And Delisle's fan. And the letters he collected from the bag room and never handed to Meadows. They were addressed to Leo, you see. They were answers to letters he'd sent. He ran quite a department down there, a separate section of chancery. Only you never knew. He's discovered the truth about Carfelt, and now they're after him. Bradfield did not move. What about the green file? It's not there, just the empty box. He's taken it? I don't know. Frashko might know, I don't. You've got to find him before they do. If you don't, they'll kill him. He went through all the files and put the case together. In the basement. I've no idea what you're referring to. I'm going to tell you the way it is on the files, then. The case against Klaus Karfelt. There's a village near Dannenberg on the zonal border, Hapsdorf, it's called. In 1938, the Germans put a factory there, research station, for certain types of gases. The local population claims it didn't know what was going on, which is probably true. The labour was foreign, French and Poles, and everyone knew about the animals. Monkeys mainly, but sheep, goats and dogs as well. Animals that went in there and didn't come out. He looked at Bradfield in wonder. He worked down there, night after night, putting it all together. Leo, he had no business down there. Oh, he had business there, all right. Two months before the end of the war, the factory was bombed by the British. At the time of the bombing, Klaus Karfelt was at home in Essen. He says he was burying his mother. She'd been killed in an air raid. Well, he was in Essen, all right. But his mother died two years earlier. Nonsense. The press would have... There's a photo stat of the original birth certificate on the file, Turner said evenly. And the death certificate. After the war, there were rumours. A French labourer, one of the few who survived, had a story about experiments on human guinea pigs. Mentioned the name of Dr. Klaus. Dr. Klaus was the administrative supervisor, made things easy for the scientists. But then an accident happened. A farmer near Hapsdorf bought a bit of waste land from the local council. By the time he'd dug it over, he'd unearthed 31 bodies of grown men. And the bodies were all, you know, messed up. What do you mean, messed up? Uh, researched. Autopsied. Someone had got there first, so the authorities opened up a case, and somebody in the town remembered that Dr. Klaus was from Essen. Bradfield was watching him now. He had folded his hands together. They went through all the chemists with the appropriate qualifications who lived in Essen and whose first names were Klaus. It didn't take long to unearth Carfelt. You've heard of the euthanasia scheme, I trust. Bradfield nodded. A clinic for the elimination of unwanted people. That's all there in the files for destruction. Uh, by the time the Hapsdorf case broke, the Americans and Germans had unearthed evidence of one busload of what they called hybrid workers being set aside for dangerous duties at the chemical research station at Hapsdorf. One busload was exactly 31 people. 
Now, when they pulled him in and confronted him with the evidence, such as they had, Carr felt he laughed at them. Bloody nonsense, he said. The whole story. Never been to Hapsdorf in his life. Find a live witness, he said. Find anybody. Well, they couldn't, could they? So the case never reached the courts. And this is the story that Harting was pursuing down there in the cellar. Oh, he'd pursued it 30 years before. Leo was the sergeant investigating. Him and Prashko. Leo arrested him, questioned him, attended the autopsies, looked for witnesses. The woman he nearly married, Margaret Aikman, she was in the unit as well, a clerical researcher. That was his life. And this word, hybrid, it was a Nazi technical term for half-Jewish. I see. Also, he would have had a personal stake, wouldn't he? And Leo never forgot. Well, he couldn't. By the end of January this year, he'd come to the only possible conclusion that Carfelt had been lying in his teeth at the time and that someone high up, it looked like Siebkron, had been covering up for him. And Leo had the proof, you see. What proof? Last year, Carfelt decided to take a doctorate. He was a big fellow by then, was worth a fortune in the chemical industry, and was making fair headway in local politics in Essen. And he did want to be a doctor. They're like a doctorate here in a chancellor. So he went back to school and wrote a learned thesis. He didn't do much research and everybody was very impressed, especially his tutors. Wonderful, they said. Wonderful how he found the time. And uh, it's a study of the effects of certain toxic gases on the human body. That is hardly conclusive. Well, it is, you see, because Carfelt based his whole analysis on the detailed examination of 31 fatal cases. Bradfield's eyes had closed. Don't worry, I mean, whatever he's done or hasn't done, Carfelt's in the clear. He's passed the post. Bradfield stared at him. No one can prosecute him now, even with a confession signed by Carfelt himself. Of course, I was forgetting the statute of limitations. Then what did Harting intend doing? What was the purpose of all this inquiring? Oh, he had to know. He had to complete the case. It taunted him like a messed up childhood or a life you can't come to terms with. He had to get it straight. And when he had... He wondered what to do next. Last Thursday, he had lunch with Prashko. What the devil for? Probably to discuss what action they should take or to get a legal opinion. Maybe he thought there was still a way of prosecuting. There is none? No. Well, thank God for that. Turner ignored him. Or perhaps he wanted to tell Prashko that the pace was getting too hot. Wanted to ask him for protection. So you really don't know why he chose this particular moment to run away? Or why he chose that one file to steal? Well, I assume Siebkron had been crowding him. Leo had the proof Siebkron knew he did. And from then on, Leo was a marked man. He had a gun, Turner added. An old army pistol. He was frightened enough to take it with him. You'll find him, won't you? You'll go easy with him, Bradfield. He needs all the help he can get. So do we all. He isn't a communist, you see. He isn't a traitor. He thinks Carfelt's a threat to us. He's very simple. You can tell from the files. I know his kind of simplicity. He's our responsibility, after all. Oh, is he? You'll forget he has stolen a file. You seem to think all of a sudden, that you can see into his heart. Why did he steal it? What was in that file, Bradfield? But Bradfield was already pushing his way to the door. It was a cold, grey morning still, but the earth was lit with the clarity that follows rain. They drove very slowly with the windows right down. Ahead of them rose the Bundestag. Police were everywhere. Seldom could a seat of democracy have been so well protected from its Democrats. 
A television crew was setting up its arc lights. The grey crowd obediently waited. I'll park down by the river, Bradfield said. God knows what it will be like by the time we come out. What's going on? A debate. Amendment to the emergency legislation. I thought they'd finished all that long ago. In this place, nothing is resolved. Along the embankment, as far as they could see on either side, grey detachments waited passively like unarmed soldiers. They stood in perfect silence, waiting for the order to protest. Side by side, Turner and Bradfield walked slowly back, the latter ahead, stiff-backed. At the door, the guard objected to Turner, and Bradfield argued with him shortly. The lobby was dreadfully warm and smelled of cigars. It was filled with the ringside murmur of dispute. They descended the steps to the restaurant. Before anything else, Turner saw the cigar. It was very small and lay in the corner of his mouth like a black thermometer, and he knew it was also Dutch and that Leo had been providing them for nothing. Soup, he shouted across the room from his table as he shook their hands. Bring some soup. What do you guys come for? Prashko's personal opinion? The voice of the opposition? He explained to Turner. When you've got a coalition, the opposition's a damned exclusive club. He laughed very loud, sharing the joke with Bradfield. Out of the corner of his eye, Turner saw two men, blonde-faced in dark suits and suede shoes, quietly take their places at an adjoining table. The waiter went to them quickly, sensing their profession. We're looking for Harting. Bradfield said. Sure. Prashko was used to crisis. He's been missing for a week since last Friday morning. Listen, Leo, that guy will always come back. Bradfield continued. We thought he might have consulted you. What about? Ah, that's the problem, Bradfield said with a little smile. We thought he might have told you that. We felt that if he needed advice or money or whatever else one needs at certain crises in one's life, he would instinctively seek you out. We thought he might even have come to you for protection. Prashko looked at the cuts on Turner's face. <laughs> protection? We haven't very much time. Bradfield was leaning forward and speaking very quickly. Prashko waited. If you can help us to find him without fuss, if you know where he is and can reason with him, if there's anything you can do for the sake of an old friendship, I will undertake to be very gentle with him and very discreet. I will keep your name out of it and anyone else's as well. We must find him before they do. Prashko watched him with his small, hard eyes, saying nothing. I also appreciate that you have special interests which must be served. Prashko stirred a little. Go careful, he said. Your own involvement with Harting 20 years ago, your association with certain British government agencies. Nobody knows about that, Prashko said quickly. You go damn carefully about that. I was going to make the very same point, said Bradfield. Okay, Prashko said at last. I go along with you. We had lunch together. I haven't seen him since, okay? And he talked about his difficulties, whatever they may be. Ah. Uh, he wanted to know about the statute of limitations. I tell him if it's manslaughter, it's 15 years. If it's murder, it's 20 years. If it's Nazi murder, longer still, because they waited a few years before they started to count to 20, okay? So then he shouts at me. What's so damn holy about 20 years? Then he got angry. You ever seen him angry? No. So then what happened? Turn on. He said to me, it's happening again, Prashko. Somebody has to stop that bastard or you and me will be wearing labels again, okay? Bradfield spoke first. If he had found the proof, which we know he has not, what would he have done? Oh, Jesus, I tell you, he'd have gone crazy. Who's Aikman? Turner asked, entering the long silence. What's that, boy? Aikman. He was engaged to her once. What became of her? Uh, I never heard. From that corner still, the clean faces watched without expression. Four pale hands lay on the table like weapons put to rest. You betrayed him, Turner said. You put Siebkron onto him. He told you the lot and you warned Siebkron because you're climbing onto the bandwagon too. Be quiet, said Bradfield. Be quiet. He's crazy, Prashko whispered to them both. Don't you realize he's crazy? 
You didn't see him back in those days. You never saw him back with Carfelt in the cellar. You think they worked you over? Carfelt couldn't even speak. Prashko's eyes were screwed up very tight. After we saw those bodies in the field, you know, they were tied together before they were gassed. Leo went crazy. I said to him, listen, it's not your fault. It's not your fault you survived. Did he show you the buttons, maybe? The money from the camp? You never saw that either, did you? He's a monk. He's a crazy monk who won't forget. Sure, I told Siebkron. You're a clever boy. But you've got to learn to forget as well. Christ, if the British can't, who can? As they left the restaurant, they encountered Sam Allerton. Have you heard what they're saying? He asked. What who is saying? Old Bono boy. You know what happened at Hanover? You know why they rioted? Somebody shot at Carfelt in the middle of the music, shot at him from the window of the library. Some friend of the woman librarian, Ice. She worked for the British in Berlin. She was an emigre, changed her name to Ice. Afterwards, she told it all to Siebkron before she died. The crowd in the lobby swept them outwards into the fresh air. Now listen, Bradfield, they found a bullet from an English pistol. You see what the rumor is? The Brits are assassinating Garfeld. Along the embankment, the motionless columns waited patiently. They stood on the bank, side by side. The palest mist, like breath upon a glass, drew in the brown horizons. Garfeld is hidden until tonight, Bradfield said. Siebkron has seen to that. They'll expect him to try again this evening, and he will. Make Siebkron cancel the rally. If it were in my power, I would. If it were in Siebkron's power, he would. He indicated the columns. It's too late. Turner stared at him. What's the bargain with Siebkron? What's the small print, Bradfield? There is no bargain. Either they destroy Harting or he will destroy Carfeld. Either way, I have to disown him. Bradfield, what about Carfeld? Wasn't Leo right about him? There are quite different ways of dealing with Carfeld's case. Leo found one. The wrong one, as it happens. Why? Never mind why. He began to move away from Turner, but Turner called after him. What made Leo run? Something he read. What was in the green file? What were those formal and informal conversations with German politicians? Bradfield, who was talking to who? Lower your voice, they'll overhear. Tell me, you've been having conversations with Carfeld, haven't you? Is that what sent Leo on his night walk? Is that what it was all about? Bradfield did not reply. Holy God, we're like the rest of them. Like Siebkron and Prashko. We're trying to make our number with tomorrow's lucky winner. Take care, Bradfield warned. Carfelt came in from Hanover that Friday night, secretly to Bonn, for a conference with you. Siebkron laid it on, and Leo followed you because he knew what you were up to. You're out of your mind. No, I'm not. But Leo is, isn't he? Because Leo suspected all the time in the back of his mind he knew that you were secretly reinsuring against the Brussels failure. And when he saw the green file, he knew. And that's why he was in a hurry and had to disappear. He had to stop you. He had to stop Carfelt before it was too late. You've got to get the green file back, haven't you? Because you signed the minutes to those meetings, didn't you, Bradfield? He took the green file for proof. It was a document of the highest secrecy. He could go to prison for years for that alone. But he never will, because you want the file returned, not the man. It must have made Seep Crohn's blood run cold when he found out that the British Embassy had been sending out letters asking about Carfelt. Maybe the Brits are sizing up to blackmail Carfelt on the side, he thought. And that's not all. After Hanover, it looks like we're trying to assassinate him as well. 
It makes no sense, of course. Why kill the man you want to blackmail? Steve Crow must have been puzzled sick to know whose side you were on. Now you know it all. You know the secret. Keep it. Without another word or glance, Bradfield walked away. As Turner watched him go, there rose suddenly behind him an unearthly rumble of feet and voices. The columns had begun to move. Bon had never seen such faces. The old and the young, the lost and the found, the fed and the hungry, the clever, the dull, the governed and the ungoverned, all the children of the Republic, it seemed, had risen in a single legion to march upon her little bastion. Burnham Wood had come to Dunsinane. Turner was looking everywhere, into every face and every window, every shop, corner and alley, looking for a face he had never seen, and still they came, more of them, cramming the mouths of the darkening alleys, craning their necks for the sight of the speaker's stand, searching for a leader, faceless men searching for one face. Music, Turner remembered. In Hanover, he tried when the music was loudest. The music is supposed to drown the shot. He remembered the hairdryers, too, and thought, he's not a man to vary the technique. If it worked before, it will work again. That's the German in him. The murmur of the crowd rose to a visceral, hungry, loving roar, deeper than any single throat, more pious than any single soul, more loving than any single heart, and died again, whispering down as the first quiet chords of music struck. At that moment, Carfelt appeared on the speaker's scaffold before them. No one introduced him. He did not say his name. The chord of music which announced his coming had no companion. It was so softly, unobtrusively done, that to Turner it seemed that the whole massive gathering actually inclined its ear in order to save Carfelt the pain of raising his voice. Afterwards, Turner could not say how much he had understood, nor how he had understood so much of the address. Directly across the square, assembled in an unlit side street, a silent concourse of men waited. They carried banners that were not quite black in the twilight, and there stood before them, Turner was certain, the remnants of a military band. At its head stood a solitary figure, his arm raised like a conductor's, held them motionless. Hurrah for democracy, Carfelt was now saying. Democracy is like Christ. There is nothing you cannot do in the name of democracy. Plushko, Turner said quietly to himself. Plushko wrote that for him. Democracy is to run a colonial empire, to fight in Vietnam and to attack Cuba. Democracy is to visit your conscience on the Germans. Democracy is to know that whatever you do, you will never, never be as bad as the Germans. He had raised his voice to give the sign, the sign the band expected. Once more, Turner looked across the crowd into the side street, saw the white hand, white as a napkin, fall lazily in the lamplight, and glimpsed the white face of Steve Crone himself as he quickly relinquished his place of command and withdrew into the shadow of the pavement. The Sotsis! Someone cried, far out across the crowd. The Sotsis are in the alley! The socialists are attacking us! It's a diversion, Turner told himself. Sipkron staging a diversion to lure him out to make Leo Chance's hand and hears the music to drown the shot. And sure enough, the music began. The little band was advancing into the square. It could not have been more than 20 strong and the army that marched in its wake was ragged and undecided. But now their music was everywhere, a socialist terror magnified by Siegtron's loudspeakers. The scaffold was empty and Carfeld had gone, but the socialists were still marching for march, for jury and war. The music had risen to a single note, a raucous, crude, deafening roar, a call to battle and a call to anger. A radio crackled nearby and Turner heard Siegtron's voice, cool and perfectly clear. He heard the mordant command and the one word in German, Schafott. And then Turner was running through the way, making for the scaffold. Then he saw him. Leo! 
He was crouched like a pavement artist between the motionless feet. They stood all round him, but no one was touching him. They were packed in close, but they had left room for him to die. Turner saw him rise and fall again, and once more he shouted, Leo. He saw the dark eyes turn to him and heard his cry answered. To Turner, to the world, to God or pity, to the mercy of any man who would save him from the fact. He saw the scrum bow and bury him and run. He saw the Homburg hat roll away over the damp cobble and he ran forward, repeating the name, Leo, Leo. He had grasped the torch and smelt the singeing of cloth. He was wielding the torch, driving away the hands, and suddenly there was no resistance any more. He stood on the shore beneath the scaffold, looking at his own life, his own face, at the lover's hands grasping the cobble, at the pamphlets which drifted across the little body like leaves in the gathering wind. There was no weapon near him, nothing to show how he had died, only the crooked arrangement of the neck where the two pieces no longer fitted. He lay like a tiny doll who had been broken into pieces and carefully put together, pressed down under the warm bon air. A man who had felt and felt no more. An innocent reaching beyond the square for a prize he would never find. Far away, Turner heard the cry of anger as the grey crowd followed the vanished music of the alleys, while from behind him came the rustle of the light approaching footsteps. Search his pockets, someone said, in a voice of Saxon calm. <laughs>